A quick disclaimer before we start. The first hour and 15 minutes of this episode sound and look less polished than our usual standard, and it's honestly a small miracle that Nick, my intrepid editor, was even able to salvage the original files and get it to where it is now. Long story. I hope you stick around, though, because these guests were really fun. We had a really great conversation. Everything sounds dramatically better in the second half. And um, yeah, let's just get on with the show. Uh, Starting in three, two, one, go. This episode is about minutes 116 through 120 of Solo, A Star Wars Story, featuring returning guests, my friends, the Band Batch. Hello there, and welcome to Star Wars Music Minute, where we celebrate the music and sound of Star Wars five cinematic minutes at a time. I'm Chrysanthi Tan, you can call me Xanthi, and today is all about minutes 116 through 120 of Solo, A Star Wars Story, in which we have Kira putting an end to Dryden, Kira and Han having a tender moment, Darth Maul, and Beckett and Han stuff. Um, It's an action-packed five minutes, as the end of this film is a lot happening and uh i got through that intro without laughing so i guess i'll welcome back james waterman and justin scheid hello my friends hello hello uh i'm so glad you gave us a disclaimer this time pre-airing there's a whole intro that we need to wait for (laughs) and there's a countdown and silence because you did not do that last time you were on here and I, we sat in silence, but when I watched it later, I realized you like put the the music over. So I, so I, on stream, I'm like, oh, are we gonna start? But I'm really glad now. I didn't feel as silly, um, uh, and I didn't interrupt you this time. So th- thanks for for prepping us this time. You're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> and for those of, uh, and those not. Uh, those that are listening and not watching on YouTube, uh, we are wearing matching Darth Maul t-shirts that Xanthi so, like, secretly <laughs> mailed Justin and I. Um, and uh, I'm realizing this is the, my, my first time really wearing it. Me ever. too. Mm-hmm. This was like, you, like, Same. sent it a month ago or something like that, right? Yeah. Uh huh. And I'm realizing there's like a lightsaber on the sleeve. Oh yeah. Which is like pretty, uh, like pretty pretty extra. Um, there's a whole red, red lettering on red background to Darth Maul up your arm. Yeah. You mm-hmm. see that. It's 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 spelled out. That's For those listening, we'll have to take a screenshot of this and I'll post it on yeah. social media when this comes out because it's pretty. I mean, we look pretty cute. Um, <laughs> we do look cute. <laughs> and today we are here to talk about the same minutes that you all were on to talk about last film, which is minutes 116 through 120. Oh, Did that you right? even realize? That? Yeah, you had 100. Yeah. You had the same exact minutes, but from A New Hope. Wow. So, wow. yeah. This should this should be the thing. <laughs> yeah, always minutes 160 through 120. That's about as long as you can get through a, a Star Wars film without being like, bring in the Bad Batch, you know? The ba- Come on, we need <laughs> yeah. some. Right. Yeah, we need, we need to bring time. them in. Well, we're here, and luckily, um, well, in addition to just talking about the minutes, which we will definitely will, there's some there's there's lots of musical things happening. Um, and, oh, why did my computer, can you still see me? Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's that's good. Um, uh, my display just like went to sleep, but that's fine. Okay, if you can still see me. But anyway, what I'm trying to say is I have questions submitted to us from people of the oh, internet. Great. So um, we will also have some questions specifically for us both like, about these minutes and you know stuff like that to get through. It'll be very exciting times, I promise. Um, so. Before we get into the minutes, I, I just want to ask out front, is there anything in these minutes musically that, or sound design wise, um, that really sticks out to you that we have to make sure not to skip? Justin? Um, I've got some cool notes about this kind of Kira Han theme mutation that I kind of yeah. liked in the score. Um, how that melody transforms. Okay, class. Um, next person. 
Um, I, I don't know. I mean, I think I'll probably just remember it as we go. Uh, um, but um, uh, I, we probably shouldn't skip the part where Darth Maul is on the screen. Probably. Um, okay. I'd say, yeah, probably. Uh, yeah. I'd say if we get through this five and we like, oh, oops, we've got to talk about that Darth Maul moment. That's probably uh, probably <laughs> want to go back for that. Um, <laughs> uh <laughs> That's probably an important part, um, but uh, no, I, I, I'm, I got more. I have more questions than anything because oh. you know, and for those of you listening that don't know this combination of of particular Star Wars fans, uh, we often react live to television offerings from Star Wars. And usually, when we do that, we get it from the get go, meaning we we get to we do it at every single episode of a series, meaning that we can kind of build a repertoire amongst ourselves with the themes. Now, Xanthi, you've been doing this yourself, but Justin and I haven't. So there's a number of themes, at least on my end, that I I just have questions like, hey, where else has that happened in the, because I haven't, I haven't really gone through the rest of the movie other than these five minutes. Um, cool. Yeah, fair to, enough. To really reference. So I'm really going to be curious about like, hey, what is this theme? Or hey, where does this happen before? Because I want to say that I, through my limited research that there's um there's some really interesting connections um you know so there's some blatant connections which we'll talk about uh between other star wars themes mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> and, for sure but then, then there's there's also a really interesting one that um i'll probably want to take uh, uh bring up and there's a little theme there that i'm going to ask you what it is so, so well you piqued my interest as cryptic, as cryptic as i can be so yay you'll be a good litmus test for me uh, like because you'll, you'll probably represent more of what my mindset was going into at the beginning of the season. Sure. And so I'm just curious what from this movie without having tried too hard to like keep up what actually has just stuck with you. Um, yeah. so yeah. Okay. Let's start listening to the minutes. How about that? Ooh. Okay. Yeah. It's going to start abruptly in combat. So just be aware today. I'm yours. There's some serious oh. stuff happening there. Yeah, there's some yeah. Okay, I'll stop there. Um I gotta say that's a that's a that's a nice knife to the chest kind of sound. <laughs> it <laughs> just I'm listening yeah, to it and not watching that. <laughs> it's got a nice, uh, yeah, design. And there. Justin, I don't know uh, on Xanthi, I don't know about it. Your end, but Justin's pretty low in my on my end. I don't know if it just wants to just turn gain up. Oh yeah, you can turn gain up if you want, but it's but uh, he he you're you're okay on my end. We can anyway. Um, the sound design there, like on Star Wars Minute, they've been talking about sort of, or I mean, not they've been talking about, but just like at least one guest has sort of brought up the swords or why, like, I don't know, not bringing a knife to a gunfight or something like that. Sort of like sure. what, what's a up with your fight, right? Like what's, fight. <laughs> right, like what's up with these right. just sort of just hand to hand combat type of things happening maybe the, because of the literal backstabbing that that is that is happening right it's like an in-your-face metaphor of just the literal st stabbing i mean they don't literally stab in the back but maybe just the the sheer gu uh, gut stab of the betrayal that's happening maybe Ooh. the the, the <laughs> act of using making it making it a, a blade fight makes it a little bit more personal right it does make it more um, personal it also makes it more noisy yeah. Like yeah. in a in a way sure. that you know have more fun playing with the sounds, for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's not so a lot of blaster, I imagine blaster, like. Blaster. Yeah. There's not a lot of like, uh, probably not a whole lot of sword fully used in the saga uh, up until this point. You know, uh, not very often at least. You know, I can't think of another saga film or like film. Maybe with the dagger, sword fight. Other, but I mean, we're used to laser than, swords. Yeah, right. I just meant like actual, uh, sorry, like uh, analog 
<laughs> long sword fights. I can't think of another sword fight, honestly, in a in a film, in a Star Wars film, other than uh, Ray and uh, Luke in uh, in Last Jedi. But that's more like a cane stick fight, right? Right. <laughs> or or staff fight, right? Right. More like a staff fight than a sword fight. So I don't know if unless somebody can throw it in there, I can't. I can't think of another sword fight uh, in the films. I know that there's there's a, a handful in the cartoons. Um, yeah, I can't think of any off the top of my head either. Yeah. So this is probably the first time you get like that kind of sword fighting, you know? So Yeah. It does it sound out of place to you? I don't think it sounds out of place. I think it it's just different. I mean, and this whole film was like different. <laughs> it, <laughs> be so, you know, um just with, Justin, with, you're so nice. I, 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 I mean, this is the first time we get like space Cthulhu, like in a in a Star Wars film. You know, like this movie has got some moments that are very have not happened. You th- what do you think the the space slug is like? A, is is similar? Well, well, it depends on what aspects you are considering. Like it's similar I mean, like, in that it's a, a space like monster. A cos- a cosmic giant space monster. Yeah, I mean, no, I, you're, I, I take your point for sure. I take your point for yeah. sure. Yeah. yeah, no, it's a, it's an interesting. Well, that and it's got, like, I don't know. I guess with this like big, I jokingly say swashbuckling theme behind this entire fight, this bum, ba ba bum, 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 kind of a thing mm. with the swords. It kind of turns it into a dare I say space pirate movie. Sure. Um, for a second. That's there. a very well because it's got in uh, dun, da, da, dun, da, 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 yeah it's in uh, it's in basically like a twelve a right um, and this is Han's theme right if yeah this I'm is correct yes this is Han's right. heroic variant of his theme or heroic version of his theme and it it yeah. is very like Pirates of the Caribbean like and I, mm. yeah. What I like about the theme, and I went and listened to the, and I know that we're not going to really talk about the theme itself, you know, the John, the actual like track, John mm-hmm. Williams's track of the it. Adventures I'm of sure Han. You, you, yeah, you've already talked about it on the on this show. I mean, not actually, not, not probably directly. not that much. Yeah, not 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 really directly, I, although I the to, closing music I, is kind of based on it. Yeah, I I, I went and listened to it. And it's a, it's. Dare I say it's one of uh, John Williams' most most polyrhythmic pieces of music he's probably ever written. Um, like that whole track is three z- different permutations of th- of three pulses: one, two, three, one, two, three, or da, 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 on top of one, two, three, four, 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 which I find kind of fascinating, considering that's so in character character with Han, who's an incredibly conflicted person, right? He's like, he's got two different tracks that he's kind of in it at all times. He's kind of like, he's really a good guy. And that's what Kira says to him in this movie, right? She's like, you're the good guy. You're mm-hmm. not the bad guy, right? And he's like, no, I am the bad guy, right? And so I really like that Han's theme itself is polyrhythmic. It's got, it's t- it's clashing about, uh, different uh, pulses on top of each other. And the, and the rhythm of the, of the actual main track is really, really polyrhythmic. However, this version, though it is polyrhythmic, is it shares a subdivision. So that this this section is really just da 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 So everything fits nicely in a grid, even though um as opposed to the main track where you literally have like sixteenth notes over triplets, as opposed to like being in twelve eight, and not to get too heady in the weeds here with uh, with rhythm, but um, but yeah, this to, is this, this to me sounds like there's no conflict here, rhythmically. Yes. Um, mm-hmm. uh, Although there's so the illusion right. of there's like the illusion of that the uh, of that of the like I know what you mean because there is the like the theme. Um, it has one of those, you know, brackets that's, you know, over the 12, like, oh, if it's in 12, eight, it has one of those things where it, it okay, let's just, let's probably just play it oh. again. You, like, but it, but it, it evenly splits out. So like, it sounds kind of like yeah. it is, uh, like kind of funky in the rhythmic way, but it falls squarely like yeah. on the subdivision. So it doesn't quite get there. And Something like that also happens later in these minutes when we start to get Maul and 
Um, we'll get to, we'll get to that there, but, but like I, there's lots of like hidden pulses yeah. in places or just, yeah. 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 I, yeah. I would say it all fits nicely in a grid. There's not really like conflicting subdivisions against each other. Right. Um, yeah, which, right. yeah, go ahead, Justin. And when I dictated this out just for my own kind of oh, notes, nice. I wrote it in three, four which is mm. kind of how I heard the theme and the changes, which fits, if we want to get into <laughs> the weeds of rhythm, <laughs> fits into a 12-8. Oh, yeah, as, as a yeah, subdivision, it's all, you know, kind of. I'm, ever, I'm never a fan. I'm never a huge fan of the what you said, Xanthi, which is like the 12-8 slash do, 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 thing. Do, do, do. Yeah. yeah. I'm never a fan, especially as somebody that studied a lot of like polyrhythmic West African music. It's like really all the same, and if you're hip enough, you can feel it in both. So like, <laughs> so, uh, I, but, so why me, don't why aren't you a fan though? Like you just aesthetically don't like it, or you, or you? Yeah, like, I think it's a false dichotomy. I, it, my my like personal rhythmic philosophy. I think that the it's like the point of polyrhythm is that it's poly. It's not, it's, it's not one or the other. And can so you explain you polyrhythm? Po Cause now that yeah, we've talked about this for a while, I just want to make sure yeah, yeah, we're bringing yeah. people along. <laughs> right. And this might be controversial and I don't, it's not like a one size fits all statement, but I'd say generally either like if you're going to notate music, that's polyrhythmic, then I'll explain what polyrhythm uh, means within the context of like threes over twos, which is like, you know, the idea of like hemiola. Right. Um, but we've got like, Pulses, see you got pulses. Right? Okay, so I can I can either group those in groups as a three. One to the 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 but if I group them in twos, one to one to one to one to but I keep uh if I keep uh another instrument on the threes, I I create a conflicting um uh feels. So we have one going one two uh one two three one two three one two three one two three one two 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 like I said, I don't want to go too far in the weeds because this will lose. Because also slash not. notation, but, <laughs> that how do you know like? Right. So my my point is like notation in itself isn't good at 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 uh it already fails in so many ways to like really portray what's happening orally regarding with it. So just pick one and just write it the way you want to write it. You know what I mean? And, okay. You know, so I this that's, clarifies. That's always been my. Yeah. This clarifies what you're because I wasn't sure if you were talking about the rhythm itself bothers you or the way of notating the rhythm. The notation. You're talking okay. about the notation. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And when people speak about it as well, they're like, no, that's in three, four. No, that's in twelve eight. It's like, no, it's actually in both. And if you're cool, you can recognize that it's both. <laughs> you know? Okay. Like there's no, I don't know there's how no dichotomy here. And okay. no no reason to to split hairs here. We can we can chew walk and Chew bubble gum so just to clarify, listeners, there is nothing so far in necessarily in these minutes that we were just talking about. I mean, he was, no, no, no. This, James was I reacting. So because, okay. Yeah. You know, James was reacting to the section, way that I described it. Yeah. Where I, I, well, I just think that you could probably notate this section either in 3, 4, or 12a, and you're both correct. Um, and that's the point of it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But um, neither of us really because, cared that much. Yeah, yeah, not yeah. not really. Anyway. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> Percussionists. I mean, I got an argument. Anyway, there's some splitting hairs it, already. You, know? <laughs> you got an argument, Justin? I mean, I mean, it it it's it's more of a to me it sounded like three fours with triplets in the quarter notes kind of a thing. So it's more of a nine eight, dare I say, but it doesn't feel <laughs> yeah, like it's it. like you know what I mean? Yeah, we yeah we can split hairs, but then there's a difference between three four or it could be nine eight versus right? a three four nine eight kind of a thing. Yes, yeah, because I'm yeah, hearing kind of a thing. 
right? Um, <laughs> play it back. Play it back. Yeah, no, I was just no, 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 now we're in this. I was just gonna say. <laughs> I think this is a time where now I just have to play some of it so that we just go ahead and bring. Play it. Let's bring people back on <laughs> yeah, board. But um, perhaps I should start. Uh, play, perhaps yeah, I should play like from nine eight than a twelve eight. Sorry, I misspoke before. It's okay. More like, uh, it's it's the it's felt in like three. The point is the eight part. Okay. The point is the eight part, meaning whether you're thinking of it in eight, never mind. Let's just hear it. Let's just listen to it so that we can make this tangible because <laughs> <laughs> that might help. Right. Okay. Oh my gosh, is that super glitchy? Put that with like triplets and three four. You could say that it's a nine a, and then you say save. Yeah, some it, that's that's you know? that's my that's my argument. Um, yeah, so I would say like, and it, what I really like about this little moment is that 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 and bomb dig it a dun die one two three go one two three those little hits on beat two. Um, yeah. Which is like not a very comfortable spot for most folks when they th feel threes. Like either put something on three or one. Like this feels really nice. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, or one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, kaku, kum, kaku. That tech those those feel most comfortable, I think, for most folks, uh, when you're in two. Putting a clap or a or an accent on two. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two. It's very mazurka like. Sure. Yeah. A lot of by the way, there's a lot of traditional music from the, around the world that really capitalizes on the, that that second second beat of threes. Uh, and for mm -hmm. non Westerners or non people not from those areas, it's like real it can be really hard to learn some of that music. There's a lot of West African music that that um that really accents out one two three 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 and it feels so weird to do. Um but yeah the, I like I like this right there. And the second one is right when they when she's like on the it's so funny. I think I watched this trailer so many times before it came out that I only I there's a couple shots in this movie that I like only associate with the trailer. I'm like that wasn't the trailer uh, for this movie cuz I was so excited for this movie when it came out. So I was just like watching this trailer on repeat. <laughs> um, but yeah, there's that one where she spin around on the floor and she like yeah. And that 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 lands right on 1 2 3 1 2 3, right? Um which is a, a really fun moment. So meanwhile, the violins are doing sort of a, a spiccato eighth note thing over and over again, where it's like, rest, did, 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 did. It goes, <laughs> one. Like, I can't really talk while playing, but it's, it's like, um, it, it's actually, you know, it's action scoring, basically. Yeah. And then they get into this, all the strings get into this, like, dig it a 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 Yes, but you can barely hear it. You can barely hear it. Except you have to listen to the soundtrack to, like, really hear it. Because it's mixed so low here. It's mixed pretty low. Yeah, the soundtrack sounds very low. The soundtrack really sounds very different. But, yeah, this is low. Actually, another question with this. Is this, throughout... Kind of like what you were asking, James, what themes are associated with what and things like, you know, this this is a Han Solo type, like, associated theme. You mean the... Dun, do, 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 do. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like his, Which his is like main theme, right? Yeah. Yeah. That... Main theme. But, but the scene focuses on Kira, which is interesting. I mean... Yeah. It's kind yeah. of not a uh, Han Solo moment it's yeah. more like uh she's seemingly saying, choosing like, his side like a, in this moment exactly because right? it does pop totally, in and totally. out like it it comes after she says i'm yours and it's oops and actually the way that it sounds there is kind of different than it usually is like it there's yeah. a note tweaked where instead of this is raised a half step so it's it's chromatic. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes. Um. And the, yeah. Who knew that? Who, who knew that? 
Han Solo's uh, melody was almost the lick. All oh, right. Um, dee, 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 dee. It's, a, it's one note away from the lick. Um, <laughs> well, Han Solo's theme is like one note away from many th- themes, yeah. from many things. And I think that is something that like a couple that I've talked to a, on a couple episodes with a couple people is like a lot of the main themes are sort of playing in the same like diatonic playground and yeah. could be kind of mixed with each other for you both blurring effect but also it makes it easy to weave them together in a purposeful way so you know there's Mm -hmm. pros and cons this and rogue one i'd say i call i i consider these two like kind of pre mandalorian uh safer scores uh uh, genre wise and the reason why i say that is because these ones are really like we're gonna really go for like the John Williams style uh, in many ways. Um, there's a couple moments in here that stick out that I in the whole score that I think John Williams wouldn't necessarily really really go in that direction. But I find that the this and Rogue One feel like very like mm-hmm. we're trying to do the big cinematic Star Wars, you know, a romantic orchestra John Williams style. And then like when Mandalorian came around, there's like I felt like that was the first big live action Star Wars content as of late to really go in like a weirder direction than we'd typically seen. So I feel like, I feel like there's a couple things that feel like they were like, let's, let, let's see how much we can make this like remind people of old Star Wars, John Williams scores, you know, like it's kind of like the Rogue One theme basically is a play off of the main theme, right? Boom, boom. Right. Boom, 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 right? Yeah, um, but that was... But John Williams wrote Han's theme. Yeah, yeah, of course he right. was involved. I was, gonna, I was gonna, I was gonna say like if you're, I imagine doing these big films, you're gonna have to like run into John Williams themes. Uh, oh yeah, if you're gonna use the themes, but I just mean the right. the orchestration and the yeah. and the approach to everything sounds like it sounded familiar to audiences, and I guess that's the point. So what I'm saying is like, like it's like it feels like it was trying to, like. You know, because these these two movies, this and Rogue One, are the two Star Wars stories that were like the first time that audiences had mm-hmm. like seen a film like jump out of format, which is like what we're not like right, putting right, an right. episode the before and the stuff. thing. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. And so, so I or was purposefully like kept pretty close to the to the to, to home, you know, um, with uh, in terms of its style. Style is really yeah. What I'm here. Right. It's um, more of an attempt at the house style. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, though it does diverge quite a bit also, because even attempting to replicate or <laughs> attempting to work in the vein of Williams's style, it, it it's inevitable that you will be bringing yourself into it. And so for sure, for sure. Yeah. Um, here, the like, I don't know. It, it does feel like house. It, I don't know if it actually feels that classic Star Wars, which is fine. But I, but here it actually reminds me more of a modern, more modern film. Or I don't know about super modern, but maybe. But after, it's like certainly, like it, it's you know? more pirates here. Yeah, it sounds like it's kind of zimmery with the big, uh, with yeah. the big, uh, with the big uh, cinematic toms, I guess. Yeah. Like, those are yeah, not real times, I don't think, at least. At least I don't think. I'd be curious if they were. In um, general, John Powell's least... use of electronic drums is one of the divergent aspects of ah, the score, where it'll be, like, an orchestral thing, and then it'll, it'll be, like, drum, the, then the drums kick in. So it's yeah. a distinguishing... They sound, they sound like big, sampled, uh, cinematic toms, but I could be wrong. I mean, it could be just really incredibly well-processed uh, and compressed live right i think drums, it, but. i'm sure it could be uh both actually if you go yeah. up on john powell's youtube channel he's got midi mock-ups of a lot of scenes from han from solo mm. mm-hmm, mm-hmm. um none of the ones that i think we saw but it's got it's basically logic with the midi roll of all the parts just yeah. going by wow and it sounds pretty good so i imagine that's cool it's am- amazing and you know it's got all this crazy automation so you know you can watch that um that's cool. But I mean, yeah, composers. I had, I had a, yeah. Having to do mock-ups. Like oh yeah, please, Justin. Uh, I can't remember now. Oh no. Oh well. But I mean, are you saying that like he's got the stems? Feels... He might have like yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. No, it was, uh, no, I was going to say, just even, like, with this theme coming in, like, the way it does, heralds back to the older films, where it's like, here's the big heroic theme, insert heroic yeah. theme. <laughs> like, here it is. Yeah. I think back to, like, yeah. I always think back to, like, Alan Silvestri and the Mummy movies. Sometimes when these things happen. Oh, that's funny, because the time. sword fights reminded me of the Mummy. Right, or as uh, or, or yeah, I think like or uh, one of my favorite totally. Alan Silvestri scores. Sorry to go off topic, but like Back it's to the, the Future. Van Helsing, oh. Van Helsing soundtrack because it does a lot of stuff like this. Every time Hugh Jackman does Van a heroic thing, you get the wow. bum ba da da. You know, this like big the big hmm. theme comes in, and then it goes back into action music, and then the theme comes in when he's doing something. You know, it's 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 a fun score. <laughs> um, Should we go rewatch? Yeah, it feels I've never like seen that. that. In that in, in that same sense of like Luke going across the bridge with Leia, you know, and the, the main theme pops in, you know, it's, it's big heroic mm. time. Yeah. The placement of when themes come in, that also is an aspect of um, the style of a score, uh, which is harder to, um, I guess, talk about sometimes when we're, when we're focusing on the music itself, like what the music is doing, because the timing and like you said, Justin, like sort of that. I don't know, the, the, the timing of making the hero music come in when the hero is doing something, that also is very much a style, which in sure. more modern scores is not always, is not often utilized. And I think, mm -hmm. um, especially in like um, maybe 10 years ago, 20 years ago with like probably Inception, was that like 20 years ago, 20, 10 years ago? Probably like those types of films where we started to get more minimal, minimalist scores where a lot would happen, almost montage-like, but the music would sort of be like a four-chord ostinato yeah, the whole time. Right. It became more of a or there's no texture. music at all in so many uh, yeah. albums. Maybe, yeah. But, it, but, watching, it, uh, but it, it's more about the vibe. Vince, yeah. Yeah, I've been watching a lot of Vince Gilligan. Uh, is it Vince Gilligan or Vince Gilliam? I don't remember. Uh, the guy who made Breaking Bad and, and Better Call Saul. Mm. Uh, I've been watching his those two shows, and it's amazing how many incredibly tense moments happened in that show with zero music, like absolutely mm. no score at all, um, which I find, as opposed to... You know this, which is like every moment is like feeling like it's scored and it's like telling you how to feel about something. You know? See, I I don't know if I. Okay, let's continue with the minutes because I think like the score is even though it's here a lot, I feel like it's mixed so low that it's like almost sometimes just used for ambiance, not for like sure. that much of an effect. And I think yeah. that's one of the. I think I actually kind of take issue with the overall sound mix here. Uh -huh. Um, I was thinking the same thing, and you know what I did for this episode to prepare is I dropped your your video file into iMovie, and then I ripped the <laughs> the two tracks from the soundtrack, uh -huh. and I played it over, and I just dropped in and lined them oh, up in iMovie, that's and then funny. I muted the audio. And you've seen these like score only versions of of movies before, which I find like awesome. And I, I basically just was able to watch it as a score. I'm like, wow, there's actually a lot more information. In that the, the score, score that get, yeah. That the score has mm -hmm. that I don't hear when I'm watching the movie because it's just so, mixed so low, you know? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> oh, oh, God. <laughs> I didn't even mean that, but I'm so proud of myself. We're proud of you, too. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so. Um, <laughs> the score is so low. It's so low. Wow, that's wonderful. Okay. All right, James. So, <laughs> <you're> gonna, <laughs> so while we're chewing on that, the brilliance, um, <laughs> the end of this uh, cue is just ends with two basically root position triads. It goes like she, she goes like whack. You know, she she gives delivers the final blow, and then we hear a do. Oops, sorry. No, that's right. There we go. And it's just final. It's just, that's it. Um, right. And then Dryden thuds on the ground. Um, and so I actually separated this set of minutes into five main sections with, and the music kind of um, guides us through those five sections or the, or the music is distinctly different through these five sections. And so we're just finishing section one, which was Kira versus Dryden. Um, and the next section is probably is going to be one of the longer sections and it's going to be Kira 
plus Han, Kira and Han's moment. Um, and then just to give a preview of what's to come after that, after that we have a brief um, sort of, I call it like Akira versus Kira <laughs> section <laughs> where she's kind of in her thoughts with her destiny and everything. Yeah. And then the, the next sort of longer portion is going to be Kira and Maul. So here Kira is like a pivot for all of these, um, all of these moments, Kira and Maul. And then the last one that we end with is going to be Beckett and Han. So it's like, um, just these five different pictures that the score is painting, um, so to speak. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. And Kira's involved in what? the first four. Were you going to ask a question? Yeah. I was going to ask a question, but I'm not sure if we're there yet. So okay. maybe I'll just wait to see where, which direction you go. And then I'll ask <laughs> okay. I need to. <laughs> okay. Um, so <laughs> shall we move on to um, Kira and Han post, um, post mortem? Is that, that's what's called after someone dies, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. After, yeah. yeah. The, <laughs> Um, a tender moment with the dead, with dead people in the room. So. Mm -hmm. I had to. Yeah. No, I mean, you did. <laughs> you did. You did. Beckett and Chewbacca, you have to go after them. What are you going to do? Well, if we give all the coaxium to Enfys, we're going to need something to buy our ship with. Hmm. Rebel fanfare. And then we start this piano thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'll stop right there. First, I want to ask, was that glitchy on your end? It just, I, the music itself is very almost unusual. Low. Oh, okay, okay. Just yeah. want to make sure. Um, yeah, it is very, it's very low in the mix. Yeah. Did we pass this bit, which is, what is it? That like when when they're looking at Dryden's body, that little theme oh. there, or I think boom, boom, I believe it's uh, the, mm -hmm. those notes. Um, it's like a half step. You're talking about the secrets theme. Da, da, I don't think we got. Da. Oh no, no, we haven't gotten there yet. Well, this is no, no, no. This is when uh, this is right before, right before she like says, she chucks the the thing down and says, "I had to," right? Um, oh. Yeah, it's right there. Okay, wait. You might. You're that probably. Little, little... You're probably right. Let's let's go back and hear. It's basically, it's the shot of Dryden's face. Is what what it is. Mm. Okay. And I, it's it. Yeah. It's like 29 seconds. Had to. Yeah, yeah. the harp oh, and everything. You did. You did. Again, it's probably hard to hear because of all it's lit mix a little bit. I've got the version where it's like just the soundtrack. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. But I, I mean, it's it's this theme that seemingly that's what I wanted to ask you. Like, what is? <laughs> yeah. That, so that's the that secrets that. theme. Secrets theme. Okay. Yeah. And it happens right at the beginning of the film, right? Doesn't like yeah. when the credits come up. Mm -hmm. There's like the ba da ba everything yes, is correct. whatever. Correct. So it's been it's been there all over the place. Um, so I wanted so secrets. Later, right? Yeah. It comes up. Yeah, 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 it comes up in key places, and it is usually associated with Crimson Dawn. Right. Mm -hmm. Which is why everyone thought in Book of Boba Fett. Dee -dee -dee, dee -dee 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 -dee. I was gonna say, didn't we? He just hear this. <laughs> <laughs> Da -da -da. Yeah, you know, actually, do you remember that one scene when Crimson Dawn is fighting that T-Rex? Remember when it's like, Oh my gosh. <laughs> well, we have talked about that on the show. <laughs> remember that scene? That, no, that's hilarious, James, because I wrote half note thing pet peeve like I feel like after duress I, and I know we all have different associations to, with different notes and combinations of notes and things like that but I, I feel like after Jurassic <laughs> Park you can't in a movie anymore you just you can't you can't, you can't do that anymore just don't just don't do it <laughs> oh, believe it or not this Without topic of Jurassic Park has come up 
a couple times this season. That's funny. Like Alex oh, Robinson that. from Star Wars Minute, really, I, 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 he hears that as Jurassic Park. The last time I, oh yeah, can't remember how I know that, but for some reason I filed that away in my head. Um, oh, it was when I was a guest on their on their show. Okay, but <laughs> the <laughs> secrets theme, like I think, um, also in last episode, Alex Ludwig. DSRA guru talked about why the secrets theme is almost has uh, like a sort of a pet peeve for him too. Um, mm. But the secrets theme really comes into its own when it's like evolving over certain chord progressions. And so like, I think mm. to consider the secrets theme, I think one has to consider more than just the three notes. I think the harmonies are really important and, um, yeah. I think in general with themes, like it can be hard to decide how much information is, should be captured within the theme, if that makes sense. You know what I mean? The like, versus yeah, because a lot of the times we think of just the melody. Um, and sometimes that's sufficient. Sometimes that really is like has all the main information in the melody, but then sometimes not. And this is secrets, especially a theme that's just these three mm. notes. It's really just two notes. <laughs> this neighboring tone figure, it, it really needs that extra information to be included included with it. Yeah. So anyway. Sure. Um, I, yeah. And actually, it's kind of interesting. Um, what The first thing I thought of with that was that really well, I, well put together talk that David Collins put, uh, had at Celebration about mm-hmm. Across the Stars considering that there's like there's there's notes and melody and you know the 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 interval jumps but there's also rhythm that contextualizes it right Mm -hmm. and so that's what i wanted to bring up for this part of the minutes are you hearing some little cross of stars in this moment here like yeah uh it's like it's like um especially on when it's not when there's not a bunch of dialogue over it and it's actually just the it's it's like, um, it's like, uh, sorry, I'm listening to it right now. Um, would it help in, uh, if we continued listening, like into the piano yeah, part? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, no, no, it's not the piano. It's part. not the piano it's part. part before it's part before that. Okay. Um, Interesting. when they're, when they're about to kiss basically, mm-hmm. um, okay. yeah. Um, yeah, so I, what's part what is that how is that across the starzy? Um, boom, ba, da, da, da. We're like ba, da, da. So one second, let me listen to it. Is it right there? Um so James is listening. Um mm-hmm. so we're being quiet for him. Um mm-hmm. I don't know if I get across the stars from that, but I do get across the stars with like anything r- reminiscent of like basically falling scale patterns <laughs> because it kind of does, you know, across the stars goes and so it has that like like it kind of goes down and it also has kind of DS ERA in there too. Like, and this is, so it also kind of has this like falling, tumbling aspect to it. And so if it's, if we're talking about that, then I, I feel the connection as well. Maybe I'm thinking, yeah, maybe it's a section, um, after kind of the piano moment, um, Okay. I'll find it. I'll okay. Find it. All right. Uh, well, but it's the bum 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 bum, right? That kind of like walk down that Across the Stars has. Okay. Right, which is DSRA as well. Yeah. But uh, but the ba da 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 bum 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 bum, right? Okay. Bum bum da 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 da, right? Um. Okay, well, if you think of, if yeah. you if it comes to you, just let me know, um, because I'm hearing that in Across the Stars, but not not sure about Han and Kira. That said, here we get like 
I find this, this I feel like is a, one of the unique moments of the score because it's, well, it's basically a piano solo. Mm. And that's not something that we get very often. It, actually, we do get it in Rogue One. Um, but in solo, this is our first time having like an all piano moment. I mean, it's not all piano, like there are strings. It's like orchestral accompaniment. But the piano, the solo piano really has like such a different vibe than having the same thing carried out in the orchestra. Like you would think an oboe playing that solo or the violins right. or something. It, it's very intimate in a different way. It's it's almost this like, I don't know, It's it's got this like magical feel to it in this almost false way. It, it's almost like childlike wonder. I know it's this tender moment between two consenting adults, but it's almost this like childlike wonder fantasy score behind it kind of a thing, which kind of to me is interesting because it, it's in, in this movie when you go through it, there's Kira and Han have moments and there's some, you know, sad moments and hot and heavy moments. And this one's this like tenderness moment um, that feels weird in the movie it does because it's kind of going out of its way and then we're very soon once we get to the next minutes we figure out it's this like oh yeah she's lying to him kind of a thing to just to get him out so she can contact uh, her boss but um kind of a thing but it, it the, the music plays into this like playful don't worry i'm just behind you I smile and I think of you, blah, 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 blah. Go, go, my love, go, and closes, and then it just shifts, you know? <laughs> it's, yeah. it's this weird moment. Um, and what's cool about it, too, is just kind of how Powell is transforming this theme. Because right before it, it's these strings, and it's this kind of... moment. And then it becomes with the piano this. Something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and then it's going to transform one more time just in these next minutes. Right, because it's going to go into the secrets theme. Into the, into the secrets theme. So it itself becomes this like diminished, secretive. Yeah kind of thing. So it's like the three stages of what's going on. The piano feels like more like it's a farewell piano. to me. Yeah, yeah, it sounded a little wistful and a little sad to me, my ears. Well, yeah, also the theme is here, it's kind of over a minor, you know, minor arpeggios, yeah. when normally this theme is major. So it it is sort of, has more of um, uh, wistful was like, wist, wistful is a good word. To describe it. Like, those first notes that you just played that the string uh, string starts out with again? Oh, the yeah, strings. Justin, can, can you oh, play that real quick again? Oh, the strings were... Uh... Yeah, to me that part really sounds like the, the general... Uh, that's the part that I'm talking about. There's two parts to me that bring out that across the stars thing, and that's one of them, which is the mm -hmm. uh, boom 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 boom. Okay. Okay. Yeah. See that the, the, the minor part, the melody. Yeah. 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 That part, and then later on, there's a part like at one fifteen. There's actually the triplet, uh, the triplet form, which mm -hmm. is. That part uh, coming up at the end of, at the end of this little section. There's a there's the rhythm from the across the stars. Oh, I see. Okay, here is like, like the first time. So. Here's like one of the first times where I feel like less aware of whether it's being played to a click track. Like it feels more flowing mm. to me. More flowing. Mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah, and as it's going through these, like this is the familiar. Han and Kira melody, pretty much, but it, it does go to much more, I don't know, it feels, like I said, it's minor, but it also has a lot of aspects that I feel like come in later when we get to the mall stuff, where there's a lot more of like, okay, so it's played in like A minor, basically. But 
but there's a lot of um, diminished, like diminished leading tone, like basically like, you know, seven, <laughs> you know, um, like if we're here, it does a lot of this. So we're like dancing around the tonic, you know, kind of. So. Again, and then and then here it starts to really really kind of tumble down. Something like this. Whatever. Like it goes here, basically, you know, whatever. And then it's like yeah, it kind of goes like here. And then it's like just an A7. And then that's when we get out of the piano stuff. But like it takes us on this like. A little musical theatery written, like very. A little bit. Musical yeah. theatery. Yeah. It also reminds me of like, for sure. Yeah. It also, it reminds me like of parts of maybe even like Schubert or I'm not, I'm not even sure. But like it, it feels familiar in mm -hmm. a way that the rest of the score doesn't like it feels like something different this this solo piano thing moment really is like unique f for star wars oh yeah yeah there's not wow i can't think of another like major moment except in rogue one um in is there a big piano part in rogue one yeah the stardust stuff oh really okay um that's cool uh yeah i don't you don't hear a lot of piano by itself this like intimate in, in star wars very often nope Interesting. And it kind of tumbles out into this. I mean, maybe maybe I should just play it. I actually I'll play it. But um it goes the way that it transitions then into the secret theme is um you can like hear you can like hear their love devolving basically. Like as this is Here's where it's tumbling down. And then here it's gonna go into where it's still sweet, but it's like that huge major seventh leap, which is a minor ninth. And then here we're going into secrets. This was that third transformation I was saying. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is the end of the transformation, but. So I'll stop. I'm going to stop it right there. But um, here it's like, like when I said sort of dancing around the tonic note, like if we're, you know, well, we modulate. But the point is like when the cellos go, like it's a ma that's a major seventh. So it's just shy of the octave. And then the next time that the cellos have that big leap, it over instead of undershooting the octave, it overshoots it by another half step. So it, it sounds weird out of context, but you hear like those just big leaps happening, which to me is sort of like the chasm of this, the probability of kind of they're, they're far apart now. And it's just yeah. the gap is widening. Is that what here. it is? Okay, there's so many love, romantic love songs jazz and and classical romantic period that have large leaps in mm -hmm. their in their melodies 
And is that what it is? It's just the yearning and the longing for somebody that feels far away from you. Do you think that's what the what the psychological uh, it must be explanation is for the for the intervallic gi- giant leaps? Like, look at me. I'm as helpless as a kitten, right? There's like, I feel like there's something with giant leaps and romance. Um, and or longing or accentuating right, the distances. Is, and it's a very John Williams thing to do at the beginning of lovely mm-hmm. romance themes. Or even Leia's. Yeah, Han and Leia's theme, or Mm -hmm. his other Indiana Jones love theme, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, Uh, jump. Even even Leia's theme. Mm -hmm. Um, There we go. Like because a sixth is also you know, those are major six. Then of course, any Star Wars music discussion eventually gets around to the major sixths or the minor sixths, but. Other than just like being like, oh, it's a there's a major sixth here and a major sixth there. Like the one thing, uh, like a simple way to also look at it is just the idea of having leaps in general, like these big leaps. So yeah, I, that's what really strikes me about about this part of the score is those giant leaps that just feel so longing, so like mm-hmm. being stretched apart. That's what it sounds like to me. Or, mm-hmm. or like trying really hard to keep keep something together that's not meant to be, you know? Which yeah. Is mm-hmm. doing, has been doing this entire movie. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Trying to keep, to rekindle this. I, I, this that, their whole scripting of, of this relationship f- felt really uneasy from the get-go for me. Oh. Like our, throughout, I was, I... That wasn't super gobsmacked. I, I think they telegraphed it pretty pretty well, considering it, it never really felt like a natural, not from the very get go. I meant since she comes back into his life, you know, it seems like there was, like, it didn't seem like it was gonna. I mean, outside of the fact that we know that he doesn't end up with her <laughs> because we know that, <laughs> but but I was like, this just doesn't seem like they're going in that direction. Like everything's gonna be fine and he's gonna end up with her at the end of the movie. Um, you know, because they could have they could have made that decision and made a sequel, and he eventually like loses her or whatever. But um, but it, yeah, it always felt it always felt you know at odds throughout the whole movie. Interesting. What do you think about it, Justin? I feel like what you touched on, James, was kind of the biggest thing about this movie being in the canon in general is that we know none of our favorite characters are going to die. We know that none of our favorite characters have any stakes outside of this movie because they're all going to make it to the next movie. We know this relationship is not going to work out. Mm -hmm. We know Chewie's going to pull his head back in time and not get hit by the rock on the train because Mm -hmm. he's in all the other films. It's going to be fine. Um, You know, it was was so... That's kind of how... Some tension missing from the... Felt with all those things... Right. There, there's there's none of this tension there, but it's still made for a really great story. And yeah. with these even yearning, yearning melodic leaps of love and loss, <laughs> um, we, <laughs> you know, we're, we, we're <laughs> it's like, okay. <laughs> um, I mean, yeah, it would have been, I guess, interesting had Han and Kira found something and then we figure out in a sequel that was never to be um, why it doesn't work out <laughs> instead of, but I kind of like where this went anyways, right. where she's just yeah. on a mission and her own mission and that's all she needs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So um, unfortunately the, they, they, unfortunately they're not meant to be. And this is when um, <laughs> they're saying goodbye. <laughs> Spoiler. And um, Han is, you know, he's like, Kira. And she's like, go and save Chewbacca. He needs you and you're going to need him too. And then this weirdest line, smile. <laughs> That's the word. Whenever I imagine myself off with you on some adventure always makes me smile. And like, I had to check so many times to, to be like, is she telling him a, well, is she telling him a secret code? Like, 
Is that a practical advice or is she just saying smile? Like, is she, is she yeah, just saying like smile? Line earlier like, in the film, um, right? Where she, where he, he says she's about to tell him, hey, every time I imagined you on some adventure. Oh. Right? Like, and then she gets cut off. She gets cut yeah. off. Wow. Right? That was yeah, anticlimactic. So it no, I, no I think that's the point of, of it, of, of what you're saying, which is like, I, w- I had to like, it's not like it's such an important moment in the film. Right. Like, oh, yeah, I, re- I was really I waiting for that. Oh, answer. finally, she finished her sentence. Oh, right. wow. And yeah. it comes across Didn't get weird, it. too. And she just, out of nowhere, just blurts, smile. Yeah. It's like, uh, yeah. smile, Han. Come on. Come on, perk up. Give us per- a smile. Perk up. <laughs> give, give us a smile. <laughs> uh, okay, well, I guess that clears kinda, that up. Yeah. It reminds me of that moment in Kill Bill, if you've seen this movie, where, um, or not Kill Bill, Pulp Fiction, um, yeah. where uh, Uma Thurman's character is asked by John Travolta earlier in the movie, like, what was your line in the TV pilot that you were? And then it, they go through that whole thing where he, like, saves her life and everything. And then as she's walking to her apartment, she goes, uh, she, like, tells him the joke, right? Which is, like, the baby bo- baby ketchup, you know? Mm-hmm. The baby tomato yeah. that gets stomped on by the, t- by, yeah, and it's, like, k- ketchup. Uh, that th- this is like a lane, like a like a non-successful version of that callback, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, moment. <laughs> uh, this is, is like a what? Wait, what? <laughs> yeah. So I yeah I hear you. I Unfortunately, hear you. It's, very, it's a little awkward. Yeah, and there's a couple of awkward parts in this scene, and uh, and one of the other one is the where Con where she goes, I had to do it, and then uh, and then he goes, You did. Uh, yeah, you did. Yeah. It, you did. And he says it again. <laughs> yeah. I was like, was that in the script? <laughs> I was like, did they write that? <laughs> yeah, you did. You did. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, if my understanding is, uh, like, this movie, this movie, like, went through, like, incredible reshoots, right? And there's, like, yeah. some of it is, like, footage from when before Ron Howard jumped on. Some of it is not. I Like, the script. Yeah, so... I, I think anytime yeah. there's a, mo- a moment in this film which is kind of weird and awkward and doesn't kind of work, I think you can blame it on the production issues, you know, <laughs> as, opposed to, yeah. sure. as opposed to anything else. <laughs> well, okay, let's continue um, this brief secrets moment. Have you heard this theme enough by now? Here it is again. This is the One biggest secret time. of all. <laughs> <laughs> it's coming up. Oh. <laughs> right? That's kind of like what it's saying to you. It's like, just you wait. There's something really big about to happen. It just, right. it, it, it throws me back to Boba Fett tending on his suit. And it's just the. Oh, dun, dun, dun. no. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Which yeah, obviously yeah, this yeah, yeah you're referring to the amazing. trap um, suit up moment in Book the of Boba Fett, which I was very critical of. Um, <laughs> I feel like this is not that at all, but I, but no, well, you're, no, but I take but... your point where it is pretty repetitive and it is very, <laughs> uh, you know, once more with emphasis with, you know, what, whatever. Once more with feeling, yeah. is that what people say? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Once more with feeling. <laughs> but once more with slightly more emphasis. The reason I think it like probably, I guess, works for me is um, yeah. viewing what's happening on screen. I just get the sense that Kira is. You know, when you have like a, that's just a sinking feeling of what something that needs mm. to be done oh, yeah. and it just it kind of plays on a loop in your head and it's just like gets more obstinate and just is sort of like that basically like I feel like she's like it feels like she's walking the plank basically like mm-hmm. and visually we see various you know things closing in on her um because as she tries to secure her room like you know Han leaves and I and I do believe that like she never intended to stay with Han, but I do believe that she wishes that she were in a circumstance where she could have. Um, you think so? Yeah, I think. She, think so? I think if I think she 
wish, like, I think she wishes that she could do that, but she knows that she can't do that. And she won't choose. how dangerous her boss is. Mm. Yeah. And she's already in deep, in deep with this. And um, her choice has been made for a long time. But yeah, sure. It, you know, wasn't kind of nice to fantasize for a little bit about getting to, you know, stay with Han and do stuff that isn't calling Darth Maul your boss. Um, But here she is and you know, the door, the windows are all closing and she kind of is shutting herself off in, in, into that hole, shutting off like the outside world. She just had this adventure, which harrowing to be sure, but, you know, probably was a nice break for her, you know, away from Dryden kind of, she probably had a fun time on this adventure really. Um, and so now it's just like now her life as this next thing is starting. And so she's closing the book on her childhood, closing the book on all this stuff and, you know, taking, getting ready to just face Maul. I agree and disagree. I see, I agree in the sense where I see where you're coming from with this and after, you know, especially with the music, the transformation of themes, the secrets theme, we're going to reveal this big thing. She's got this decision to make, not even a decision, it's more like I have to do this kind of a thing. It's not even a decision at this point. Um, I guess, personally, I felt it was a little bit more sinister. To me, it was more like a big reveal of Kira's kind of been playing all of us all along, even if she had fun, even if she had a moment to be with Han Mm -hmm. again, all these things like that. That was never her mission. That was never her goal. This was just a kind of a side quest. And and what helps me with that is the conversation (laughs) that she has, which we're going to hear in just a second, she has with Maul. And the and after that, when we get a few uh, like a minute later with Beckett saying, "Is is Dryden dead? Yeah. Did Kira kill him? Don't you get it? Don't don't you see what I keep what I've been trying to tell you?" Kind of a thing. So for me, it was more of a this theme and how it builds this mm. the secrets theme and it gets more dramatic and more dramatic and more dramatic. It was more like a like a mask pull off to me like uh, yeah. like I'm the one behind the curtain kind of a thing not that she was but again meet Darth Maul who was behind this in a weird way or at least her boss um, but she yeah. kind of is working her way up the ranks now and this was kind of perhaps not her plan but in this exact way but how she spun it to f- yeah, give her you know fortune I, you know, it's interesting. It's um, that I was about to ask a question that I basically got uh, an answer to from both of your interpretations, which I was going to ask, hey, uh, do you think that Kira didn't go with with um, uh, with Han out of fear from Maul or out of desire to gain more power within Crimson Dawn and now that she's kind of killed Dryden, you know, that she's, uh, you know, is she serving her own self-interest or, I mean, of course she is, but meaning like, is this more, is she, is she driven by fear or is she driven by, you know, power? And what I also think is interesting is the, the moment we hear this theme, we don't know it's Darth Maul on that hologram yet, right? So, Xanthi, you're kind of, to your point, you're, it's kind of like, oh, it's kind of like she's stepping up what she knows that she has to do to protect herself and to protect Han, et cetera. But, you know, and to Justin's point, we don't really know that she, what kind of danger she's really in yet before we actually see the one that's on the other side of that hologram. You know, like, we don't, like, we get a comment, like, earlier in the movie where he's like, you don't know who I answer to, but we don't, who, who could that be? You know, it could be Unkar Plutt for all of you know, right? But, like, um... <laughs> Uh, but, but, but yeah, but once we do, once we see it on the hologram, then like to your point, Zemi, like, we're like, oh, we know, like, like she's in trouble and she can't leave this because she knows what would happen as opposed to like, because there's two options here. She could have gone with Han and maybe fl- fleed, fled, fled, <laughs> fled Darth Maul. But we know that, you know, she probably couldn't, she probably wouldn't be successful in that because Darth Maul is big scary Darth Maul right so So I think Darth Maul is the least important part of this of um, no okay I I I overstated that well then what is then what's keeping her there then I think it can't she leave 
No, I mean, I Why think can't she leave? I think whatever her situation is, which I just take at face value before knowing that it's Darth Maul, it yeah. even even if Dryden is just the boss, like it seems like she's in really in the thick of this uh-huh. life, this organization, she this life. Them. Everyone knows. That's, I guess my point. We, we she see killed him. him. Killed everyone knows. Right. And everyone but, so why knows can't who she, she get is. Out, I guess that's my question at well, that point. Well, I, I would never just think that it's. Like I never got the sense throughout the film that it's that Dryden is solely like uh, the bad guy. Like it, it yeah, seemed like Crimson she, Dawn is a whole organization. So killing one person in it mm-hmm. just feels right. like okay. Clearly, you're still not cutting out the root of it. You killed one leader. You know that's like thinking you killed Tarkin. So I guess my fine. point was I, but that my my other than just being a cheap cameo in the movie. <laughs> Which mm-hmm. kind of is kind of what he is, um, but, but I to me he actually serves a purpose, which being like, oh, she's in very serious. Like Crimson Dawn is extremely powerful because it's run by this really scary guy that we all know and fear, right? And he like has the force and a lightsaber, right? Like it's not just like gangsters; it's like a dude that is like a, a former Sith. To me, that is like that's his purpose in the movie is to show you like Crimson Dawn is indeed that that menacing that it's not like she could just go with Han and figure out how to escape them. It's like, oh, she won't because that organization is so bad. It's there's literally a guy that's back from the dead that's running it. Right. You know, like um, like, yeah, that, I guess I that's my point I, is that is like, yeah, yeah, I don't think he's not important. Like you like you said, yeah, I think the least he, important part. I think he is actually really important to, to, okay, to yeah. that point. I think that he cements how dangerous Crimson Dawn actually is. I see. I don't think otherwise so. we've seen mm-hmm. we see a lot of gangsters and moron smugglers throughout Star Wars. What like as an audience, our expectation so far isn't that this is any different. Now we know that they're different because it's Darth Maul running the running. But the I see Darth Maul as like us, uh, like actually Darth Maul's involvement with Crimson Dawn makes me feel like it's funny. The video delay is so big that you're just like, well, I'm just like visually it looks like you're just talking. Yeah. Um, so to me, Darth Maul's involvement with Crimson Dawn weakens Darth Maul's character to me. Like, it, Interesting. It feels, and so I get that Darth well, yeah. Maul is important from the perspective of people like Kira or people who, for whom they're not that familiar with the Force and everything. So you know, just him showing his <laughs> lightsabers off and whatever that whole thing is. Yeah, like, well, I love that it's just moment. Like, oh, yeah, he's like, just yeah, yeah. just so you remember, I have a lightsaber, yeah. and I love that it's just off screen somewhere. He just like reached, like, where was it? Where was it on the table over there? He like reaches and then it's like flies into the, it's like, why isn't it at your like hip? Like it's everybody most, else. Like, so in, and so in this case, I don't think it's so much like Darth Maul that they're afraid of. I, again, I think it's like yeah. the idea of, they're just so unfamiliar with like a, a dark force user, like dark force users in general, that the whole thing is just like spooky as hell. And they're just like mm-hmm. this idea I mean, that Maul. Has, has like Satan horns and like and he yeah. like looks like a devil. I mean, I feel like they do also fear like him. He's a pretty scary looking person. Yeah. You know, no, she's like, got that's kind of his point. She's, yeah. They got to fear him. Yeah. But in my head, I'm like, oh, but I bet Darth Maul does, like doesn't care that much about Crimson or like cares about Crimson Dawn as a stepping stone to something yeah, else. Because in true. my head, I, I always want, I mean, it's just because I want someone who is a force user to have bigger goals than running a well, that, business. Well, that's the problem with involving someone. Like that's why the, the cameos can sometimes be cheapened because although they serve the purpose for this, when they serve the purpose for the story, they also open a huge can of worms of, of questions about context. Like you just mentioned, which is like, if this was just a scary force user that we didn't know, it would be probably serve the same function and be like, Oh, that's a person that has the force and has a lightsaber and they look scary. Oh my goodness. That's so scary. But like you said, because you know about Darth Maul, you're like, wow, Darth Maul's really fallen some hard times. Like, right. like poor guy. He's like, <laughs> he's like running this, you know what I mean? Yeah. I, that's actually a great point. Right. Right. Like that's that, uh, that, that's the reason why cameos can often be really stupid, you know? Um, so yeah, yeah. Good point. 
Interesting. <laughs> and the fact uh, that Darth, just, just the fact that Darth Maul shows off his lightsaber is sort of just like oh, yeah. right. just drives that He's point home. He's a little home. lame in this mo- in this in this whole. He's thing. a little bit well, yeah, a little bit pathetic, a little bit desperate. Also, his lightsaber sound is like the most bursting lightsaber sound that I could find. I went back and I was like, oh, I wonder if that's like a pre-used, pre like a used sound from like one of his other ignition scenes in some of the other movies. And unless I'm mistaken. I could not find from the Clone Wars scenes I watched and Rebel scenes I watched. I mean, I didn't watch them all. I wasn't like a crazy person. But I watched uh, the Phantom Menace scene, and it does not sound like that. It sounds more like, as opposed to, right? And it has this like bursting <laughs> sound out of the thing. It's like so, it's like, <laughs> it's, it seems like there was a, yeah, it's very like in your face. Well, you answered one of the questions, which was, what do you think of Maul's saber sound? <laughs> I mean, it sounds good. It, it almost sounds like there was so much anticipation for Maul to be shown on screen at some point. Like, it sounds like, uh, it sounds like, you know, it's like, like a hose that you like, <laughs> that you like choked up and then let the, let the water out. Basically. That's what it sounds like. <gasps> Here's a freaking lightsaber. You know, <laughs> I think that's, I think that's as, uh, uh, I'll keep with a G rated metaphor on that one. But, uh, <laughs> but anyway, so but uh, with the hose there. Okay. But, uh, <laughs> but anyway. What do you think, Justin? Like peeing, as opposed to peeing, you know? But, uh, <laughs> but anyway, I guess that's what the lightsaber sounds well, like let's... to me. It sounds like it's like a burst of energy out, mm. you know? Well, let's listen to Interesting it. Okay, yeah. To this section. Good idea. Okay. What to do about the traitor Beckett and his accomplices? I'm on my way. It's coming up. There we go. You and I will be much more close. So, um, Justin, what do you think about that lightsaber sound? I think it is a incredibly excessive uh, display of power. <laughs> I guess I could say. I mean, we haven't heard like a lightsaber sound so extruding <laughs> before and so under yeah. pressure you know <laughs> that it yeah this is um extruding this is, like, <laughs> this is like the buying of a humvee of lightsaber sounds right? <laughs> i guess it's kind of a dated reference remember that back back in that was in the 90s or the early 2000s when humvees became like pop, like were popular for a second we had the H two dri- and the H three, yeah, yeah, and, they, yeah. and they, the whole joke was like, if you get a giant car like that, you're obviously like insecure about something. Um, but that feels like a timeless equi- joke. What's the 2022 yeah. version of that for cars? Oh, like, like a, what's, what's it's the, still? I think it's still big cars. Big is cars, a big right? Car or is probably. it you know fast yeah, cars? It's, it's a, probably t- fast sports cars. It's probably a Tesla. No, I'm just kidding. I was about to say probably t- that new Prius that everyone's no, buying. No shade it's, out it's, to any Tesla. <laughs> There's a new Prius? If I can no, afford when I buy one. <laughs> um, that's funny. I will reserve my thoughts about Teslas. Um, <laughs> but it is extruding. Um, and it it just goes back to like the whole display of power. Like the mm-hmm. just sort of, um, I don't know, just how extroverted it's extroverted it's like excited it's extruding it's like a fire hydrant exploding um lots of (laughs) lots of x prefix prefixes extra super extra it's extra extra extra. yeah well it's kind of like like that the first moment we ever see mall actually not the first moment i guess uh i guess the first time we see his double lightsaber in phantom menace he kind of he kind of like I, obviously, it's for the audience, and it's like a little bit of a meta statement of like you've never seen a double lightsaber on screen before. And he, remember that's you know I, the classic scene. Mm-hmm, he's in mm-hmm. the hangar on Naboo, and he like holds the lightsaber out to the camera, and it's like one blade, and then that's the true other blade, right? And it's like who mm-hmm. would do that unless you're literally like, dude, I have two of these, like, like <laughs> and it was like, very and- effective. <laughs> It yeah, was. and for so, many of us, it was the first time seeing a different lightsaber. You know yeah, what I mean? And, was, and that's what that. I'm saying. It's like the meta, the meta shot. It's like we want the audiences to be like, "You've never seen this before," and we're going to show it to you in the least subtle way possible. You know, um, right? Or to remind the audience 
of the initial, like, I don't know, the initial excitement that we had yes. the first yes. time we heard that, the, I guess. The funny thing well, about that is back in the 1999, there wasn't nearly as much, like, careful secrecy in trailer footage and pr- promotional materials that everyone knew that he had a double lightsaber before we even went on opening day. But nowadays, I feel like they would never put that moment in the trailer because no, it's just such a... Re- now it's, like, all about the reveals these days. But, it like, I remember, dude, I had the Phantom Menace novelization before the movie came out. Right, like I like mm. b- before the freaking movie came out, I knew the whole plot of the movie. <gasps> that, like, can you imagine that n- happening oh, today? Geez. Never in a million years could that happen. Oh so, my uh, gosh! That I used mean, to nowadays... be the thing that used to they used to put the books out because there wasn't the internet to leak everything. No, as there widely was. As... There was the internet, but but not no, 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 not sorry, in the I, same tra- sense. I, I didn't I didn't mean there wasn't the internet. What I mean is there wasn't the the internet we have today where it's just like wh- wh- there wasn't social media to the extent that there is today. That's true. That's right? true. Right? So there wasn't just like Twitter like you won't believe what happened in the book, right? There just wasn't this massive like instantaneous uh, uh distribution of information uh to everyone on the planet, right? And That's also true. And in I the think, palm of your hand. Yeah, right? and I was going to yeah. say and I think um the internet was less accessible to like young people. Oh, yeah. So yeah, yeah. I think like cuz I do hear of like Gen Xers and 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 stuff saying that they were like on the internet during the whole Phantom Menace lead up, but it was like yeah. in message boards and in like places yeah, where kids wouldn't have been. You wouldn't get an article from like Variety being like, yeah, look at this leaked image from uh, like a thing. And then you're like, you don't even care about Star Wars and you know about it. Yeah. And right? you wouldn't be messaging like, your friends. And then the next like thing in your yeah. feed that you see is a spoiler. Right. Yeah. yeah now they it's, like, it's inch- ne- yeah, go ahead. Justin. Sorry. I was just going to say now you can't even buy, I remember soundtracks used to come out before the movies because I used to buy a lot of soundtracks on CD um, and now they won't release certain names of certain tracks. Oh, yeah. Like you can buy the <laughs> yeah. whole thing on iTunes except for the last five tracks because they spoil – someone decided <laughs> to name them spoiler things or they don't want to reveal yeah. the ending to the Toys film. don't make it to the shelves by the time mm-hmm. of the movies coming out because they don't want it – they don't want the, it to get leaked within the toy uh, toy creators, like different, mm-hmm. different characters. Like there were – there was like no Baby Yoda toys. Or Grogu toys, yeah. Uh, for like for like months, 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 months after Mandalorian, um, because they just didn't make any because they didn't want to spoil that character. So it's kind of. I'm wild. still so um, grateful to, for that. I'm so grateful oh, yeah. that yeah, yeah. As somebody that doesn't collect, I know that there's a lot of podcasters that I listen to Star Wars podcasts that are like big toy collectors, and they're kind of they're, they're definitely annoyed by the fact that there's certain products that are just are not available yet, or they'll might never make. Like they haven't made a Ben. I don't think they still haven't made. They still have not made a Ben Solo action figure. I believe like there is not a Ben hmm. like Kylo Ren turned to the light side action figure. That's um, surprising. I know. I mean, there's like a Funko Pop of it, but there's not like a like, Black <laughs> Series like action figure. I believe I'd be happy to be corrected by that, but yeah, but correct us yeah. if we're wrong. We don't know, yeah, but mm-hmm. um, that would be surprising. What they do do though is they release like sneak peeks of characters that are inconsequential, like the mm-hmm. one, like the one that, um, like uh, in the episode, Tony Thaxton came on. He he was a fan of Therm Scissor Punch before the film oh, came yeah. out. And yeah, that was off. something that was shown, I guess, in the Denny's, Denny's yeah, cards. Yeah, Denny's was all that. over this. Yeah. One. I remember Denny's was like a thing for this. It's so funny. I like I like think about Denny's when I think about Solo, a Star Wars story, which is weird. That's kind of a weird. That's very weird thing. product. That's like a that that I yeah. Know. That is weird corporate synergy there. Right. Yeah. It's like I like I kind I kind of think about um, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, is it Doritos? It, there was a Godzilla movie that came out, and I think of. Either oh the 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 Matthew Broderick old yeah Godzilla yeah that, thing that crappy and, and movie Taco Bell Taco Bell Ta- that was all that's over what that's it what was. it was Taco it was Bell, Taco Bell. Was I like remember this too and, right <laughs> yes I remember yeah. this yes so anyway wow but we're at the anyway. point where <laughs> Denny's wants it <laughs> everyone yeah. everyone wants a cut of of that Star Wars of that mall especially um, yeah. Yeah, so uh, the lightsaber sound, also part two of like this question from Ender Smith, a.k.a. Auric Fonts, was what we think of the wobbly sound from the hologram. Um, like, you, you know what's really funny? We should let the cat out the bag real quick. Y- yes. Okay? 
Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And if it's not evident to anybody watching this, well, this we are now re-recording <laughs> because we lost the audio of half the thing. And it's really funny that when we initially recorded this, we're like, we should go look that up. See, here's <laughs> oh, the hologram yeah. sound. So now we look and you so, know, and, now we and sound you know what I didn't smart. do? Look I still didn't look it up. Over but Justin, guess, guess what I did? Oh my God, I'm so, I'm so glad I led with this. <laughs> we'll see. Now you I did look it up. And Here's I'm the thing. so surprised. I also looked it up last night when I rewatched, you know, the part two of The Phantom Menace, but I didn't okay. pay attention. Like, so I, so I, so I didn't really follow through on the thing. So you that were I just watching up. The Phantom Menace just to watch it? <laughs> Well, I thought yeah. like I would just hear it and you then just, I would like, remember were watching Star Wars to well, enjoy it. <laughs> oh my goodness, no! Well, no, Xanthi had to watch from the beginning to get the full impact of the wobble noise, and then under- <laughs> That's understand. That's what it is. You want that context? The, that post, yeah. you know, where that wobble noise led us to. I get it. Uh, I actually, I so it. I actually did look it up, <laughs> and uh, to my ears, they're 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 pretty much the same. Um, from uh, Phantom Menace. I, I'm specifically referencing the uh, Phantom Menace where it's Darth Sidious and Darth Maul talking to uh. Uh, uh, the, the the blockade and saying, like, I will send my apprentice Darth Maul, Darth you know, Maul. to come make sure that you That's guys good. are doing... Because that... The tone of those 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 moments are very similar, right? Like... Right, um... right. They... It's it's this it's trying to be men- it's this menacing thing. It's introducing cool. Darth Maul as this menacing apprentice oppressor menace. <laughs> um, but yeah, they're the they're they're very similar wobbly. You don't happen to have timestamp, do you? I don't. I looked it up okay. on. Uh, I, I I did a YouTube search of. Oh, I think I typed oh, in. That Phantom was the smarter Menace, thing. Phantom Menace smarter hologram, thing. Yeah. and it just. It just went through every hologram moment of Phantom Menace. It was so oh. random, but it was cool. I love I love you YouTube. Too. Yeah. <laughs> I do too. <laughs> I love people That's who so make super cuts. Yeah. Um, yes. So actually, I did pick up on something. Not the thing that I set out to pick up on. But um, what I picked up on was uh, the mixture between the voice, like, the overall sound mix of those hologram moments because uh-huh. um, one of the things that I feel in this scene is so kind of ri- kind of ridiculous um, is just how much Darth Maul's voice booms over the room at, mm. in like a very um, a very voice of God way in yes. the in the pre in the Phantom Menace. Um, the hologram moments feel a lot less dramatic, like, or a lot less showy, I guess. And mm. the music is a lot louder in them. Like, it's like, uh, mm-hmm. the voice, the dialogue is way more mixed in. And it's like, the music is sort of telling you the story. Like, I would say the music is probably more of the anchor than the dialogue because the dialogue is really just like, I don't know, it, it, the, it's not earth shattering dialogue. It's like, yes, we will send right. them like stuff like that. And, um, yeah, yeah John I, Williams I, has a, uh, has a minimum decibel clause in his contract. Yeah. Um, he must. <laughs> it's like, I need to be in mixed at least this much in the, in the, in the sound design. <laughs> if, if you contract me. Um, but so, no, but yeah. to, to your point, Chris though, like it, going back and listening to these hologram messages, they, the, the people, at least I'm again going with Phantom Menace. The people who are the characters that are in the room are a little bit louder than the holograms, just a little bit because it's where we, as an audience member, are being placed in this sound design. And the people from mm-hmm. the holograms sound like they're speaking through a phone, like their 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 voices yeah. are a little gar- they're a little garbled, they're a little muted. They have like. The uh, uh, I, I teach this to my students. If you want things to sound like they're coming from an old speaker or from a distance or a, something small, you take out the low end of uh, someone's voice, whatever it is, and it kind of uh, uh, allows it to sound distant or yeah. coming from something else. Where in this solo story, Darth Maul's voice is not only mixed louder than Kira's, it sounds like he's just gently whispering di- directly in yeah in in the room he sounds like he's directly whispering into your ear well not whispering yeah. but like yeah. speaking very clearly there's no <laughs> it's interesting communi- 
communication error. There's no sound design to the voice. It sounds like a, just a great close recording of the actor. To my like, just... to my gut feeling and 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 like immediate memory, I feel like that's been a de- departure of newer Star Wars materials. Uh, is that if to my memory, I can't remember any of the original six movies having hologram scenes that didn't have that kind of in a can effect Mm -hmm. to the voice. Like, I don't remember them being as clear as they were with like Snoke. Like that's the thing. Yeah. Snoke is the, Uh, Snoke was a, felt like a really big departure to me. Yeah. Like, Mm -hmm. and and that's, you know, cause I think it's part of the reveal of Snoke being a hologram. Cause if I'm not wrong, if I'm not like, maybe I would just read it wrong. But when that scene first happened in the theater, it was a surprise when the when the hologram gets turned off to me because I was like that is a per, that is a giant person sitting in a in a chair. Oh. To me, when I watched that in the mm. theaters, I didn't know he was a hologram until it got turned off, mm-hmm. and I thought that that was the point. Maybe I'm just a moron, <laughs> but uh, but like but to no, me, I remember I thought being surprised that, sh- that Snoke was so small. Yeah, to me, I I thought um I thought that the point of that scene in in Force Awakens was that they wanted to make it seem like he was a giant person and then the hologram is a, is like a, a surprise but maybe other people were like no I knew that was a hologram from the moment I saw it but uh, and part of that was the sound design like he sounds like he is a, a in the room and booming and to me in some ways that makes a little more sense like like just on a sci-fi aspect cuz you're like oh well this is 40 years in the future they've like figured it out how to make these how to make these holograms sound super clear right but then they go back to solo which is hypothetically you know or which is between these two movies so you don't have this like oh maybe the technology got better well this is happens before the originals right um so I, to me i'm like why do the holograms sound different right like what's the What's the technological reason why? I mean, it's more just like an artistic uh, reason is what it is. Um, it also makes me realize that like, even right now, like we're recording this or, you know, like if I'm recording something on my own, like mm-hmm. I have my nice setup, like I, this is, you know, I can have a clear audio and uh-huh. a crisp video. But if I am Skype, like if I'm just joining a Zoom call that is like, for something else, then I will also be a lot more grainy and just like on yeah. worse speakers. So the they're just if we were to take it, if we were to just like entertain this massive sound mixing difference and just think like right. okay in universe what could the explanation be? For, like one would be more like a communication like calling in, and the other would be like mm-hmm. for Snoke when Snoke is in his own boudoir. <laughs> Yeah. doing his own transmissions he has the top top tier things yeah. but then that wouldn't still wouldn't explain like w- what is up with this just ha- perfect placement of mall and mall's situation well maybe maybe it's maybe it just so happens that in these two scenarios the, uh snoke and mall were very close to wh- who they were talking to like uh, uh, geographically so maybe maybe Snoke was somewhere near Starkiller Base at that moment. We just don't know, okay? And maybe Maul was like on the planet, and maybe that's why Kira was extra scared, is because not only was Maul a looming threat, but he was out there. Like maybe he was just like like over there, you know? And and he's just lazy. And, but and also he's like, like use, higher definition. Use your magic ring. Yeah. Yeah. Use your magic ring. Uh, I'm, I'm just yeah. Use your yeah, magic yeah. ring to talk to me, and uh, even though I'm on the same planet. I don't know. I, I, Maybe I, here's the other thing, because yeah, the other the other thing I was gonna say is I don't think it's about like, um, uh, you know, because you could say like some of these, you know, when they're like on the Death Star and they're or sorry they're on uh, Hoth and there's the pop up one of Vader and he's like grainy and he's like barely knowledgeable or not knowledgeable intelligible, um, uh, you know that's you're like oh they're like on a planet on the move whatever. Mm-hmm. And, you know, maybe Maul was like sitting in his studio. He had all his gear, and so, same with the same his with Snoke. But like, but then there's the scene out. in Empire where the Emperor is is calling Vader and telling him like, we need to go convert Skywalker, your son. You know, the son, and that is like all grainy and weird too. So I don't have any. I don't have any. You know, maybe Maul was at the bottom of the space yacht. And he was just chilling this entire time. Right. No knowledge of what's going on upstairs. They're all like, on Ethernet, too. It's just... Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Maybe they're just on yeah, Ethernet. Everything is just hardwired. 
Maybe um, he's at like the equivalent of like Star Wars, like MIT at the moment. Like he's at like the, he's like at somewhere that has like incredible or like the Google complex or something, right? Where they have like amazing technology and internet available to them. And, uh, and they're just, you know, he's well, just not only that, they, they got to have some nice, like, I mean, give him a nice little lavalier mic to clip onto his robe mm. and then some right. room mics so that we could get the force sound of him calling his lightsaber over because right. we get that shroomp kind of a thing right. that okay. happens. So that was yeah, actually, that, right? that was another, that was another question from Ender, which was, can you hear the force over a hologram call? Right. And before we answer that, I just want to say like, okay, we're going to, we, okay. Because like, we should talk about the proc, we should talk about, Justin, you should do your ASMR demonstration oh, right. of the microphone thing. And then we'll talk about the speakers. Like I'm recalling the things that we talked about on Monday because now, okay, on Monday or three days ago, this is like a transmission. This is a time warp three days later. Um, if you're watching on YouTube, you will have seen the titles that I've put up. And my facial hair get a little bit more unkempt. <laughs> yeah, I've got different. And it's daytime glasses. now, so the lighting's all different. But um, the half of our, half of this like very, big episode that we recorded the audio got lost and so james and justin are just like the best friends ever and uh, uh -huh. like came and are re-recording the second half with me so a lot of this we've already talked about to ourselves so um yeah i just want to mm. so i'm gonna i recall that that was a good part of the conversation <laughs> that, be candid with our process here yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. so yeah. if we accidentally like repeat tiny snippets that we've like we I, I mostly have the flow in order so we will we won't be backtracking but if there are anything any specific details that we accidentally say twice it, that it's because there's a three-day time delay uh between yeah, part yeah. one and part two of this episode so um yeah uh, the the topic of m the way Maul's voice sounds in that room is like a big feature of these minutes and mm. it, i think it's like definitely one worth talking about so yeah. um justin like as a sound person like what is your assessment of how would you say this might be miked? Well, it sound I kind of said it a little bit uh, before where it, it sounded like a very nice, close miking of it. So for example, those that are watching or just listening, I'm about a foot away from my microphone right now. If I get closer to my microphone, you're going to hear something called the proximity effect where now I'm only like three inches away from the mic. You hear all of my mouth sounds. My voice got a little bassier. Mm -hmm. You can hear my breathing <laughs> and all things like that. And as I slowly <laughs> go away from the mic, not only do I drop in volume, but I kind of start to sound a little bit more natural. If I go even farther away from the mic, you kind of hear the whole room and my voice kind of trying to uh, reflecting off of everything mm. in the room. So what we're pointing out is that with this mall hologram is that it sounds like it was a very nice closed room post-production recording <laughs> of, uh, uh, of this actor uh, who's, who's Who's, I'm sorry. Who's, uh, no, 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 sorry. no, 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 no. Sam Whitworth. No, who's Sam speaking? Whitworth. Sam Whitworth. Sam, Wh Sam Whitworth is speaking. Right, right. Um, of uh, Sam Whitworth. Sam, Sam Whitworth. Uh, Whit Whitworth. 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 <laughs> oh goodness. Uh, Sam Whitworth, uh, where they they mic'd him real close so he could get all the expression and all the things. This is also like an ASMR thing, <laughs> where mm -hmm. it's this nice close micing so you can hear all the intricate details, um, and then you know took that recording and just kind of placed it on top of all of the uh, uh, the recording that Kira did, which sounded like it was done in the room of this place, uh, meaning that you could hear the reflections of her voice. You, there's a little bit of a distance going on between her and the microphone, even if it was a like an after dub that they needed to do for the say we know that this show uh, this movie was plagued by all sorts of reshoots um not sure if this was one of them but uh it, it literally sounds like they just dropped this very very beautifully clean recording on top of the scene without any consideration for like the room um or yeah the distance of mall it, it really just sounds like kira's talking at you from 
the other side of the room where Maul is just right up next to you, um, which is just interesting. It's an interesting choice. It makes the whole experience of Maul very. Um, I mean, I think I think the, the the what's the word the the goal or the aim with the whole presentation of everything about him, like we said, <laughs> like with the bursting of the lightsaber, the the force sound of his lightsaber mm-hmm. flying into his hand, right. <laughs> Right, where he just holds it out. I don't know if I've said this on this, you know, up until this point yet, but like, where was it? Like, where was the lightsaber pre him? Like, it was just off screen. He's like, like, usually people, lightsaber wielders don't usually not have their lightsaber nearby there. You know, I guess not. So he's just, anyway, I, I'm thinking too hard about it. But anyway, the whole thing is a little extra. And I think the uh, the aim of this whole scene is like, let's just make Maul as like intimidating and over the top in some ways. But there, I, there's, I think we've said it or, you know, it, it's just, it has this uncanny, something's not quite right about the whole thing. It all, the whole thing feels a little awkward. The whole thing feels just a little awkward because of all these little moments, you know? And I think it makes him campy. Like, I think it makes, Mm -hmm. like, I've said this since, you know, I've said this for, like, a couple years now. But, like, I think Darth Maul's return from the dead, ever since he Uh returned from the dead, he is a mixture of Scar from The Lion King and Jafar from (laughs) Aladdin. He is just a a campy Disney villain um, and is very, and sometimes it's, it's funny sometimes, like, like, he could break out into song or something like he just is so theatrical i guess that's what it is he's theatrical and um the i I guess this also i mean we're we're basically answering all of ender's questions right now which was what we thought of the dubbing situation so we're talking about it right now but um we haven't talked about the performance itself right i mean we've talked about the dubbing and the sound design of it but just to be clear i think the performance and the choice to use sam's voice was a good one. I, you know, I, I, mm-hmm. I know that there's, I think you had mentioned that there's some, some politics behind it. They originally were going to record the original overdubbed uh, actor from Phantom Menace, right? Yeah, they did originally go with they Peter Serafinovitz, yeah. but then they swapped and, him out at the end. And it makes sense for them to, 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 to go with Sam in many ways. Although, you know, I'm sure that sucks to be, you know, called back to be a part of Star Wars again after kind of a somewhat, you know, um, notable role in the past, but at the same time, I, I understand the, I understand the decision to go with somebody that is closer to the more recent, um, fan, uh, acknowledge or, you know, just identification of that voice. Right. So, uh, if they didn't go with that, it would sound even more like out of place, um, in some way to some like, viewers. Yeah. Yeah. To yeah. the ones who have kept um, up with. Clone yeah. Wars I mean, some stuff. people, d- some people, probably didn't even know what his voice sounded like because the last time they saw him was Phantom Menace and there's like one line. You're right. Right? Yeah. Um, other than <clears throat> when he gets <laughs> cut in half. That was good. That was good. That's, That's pretty good. Um, yeah, but also like I feel like what it, what's different is not only his, the voice. Uh, I feel like, or I feel like what define I, I don't know, I feel like Maul's whole essence here, there's so much that is um confounding and um i guess there's many parts to it is what i'm saying is like we can talk about the performance of it like sam whitwer's vocal performance of it which i mean i think we all think is good like i don't know i don't really have notes on i don't have notes on that it's good um yeah um and then there's this the recording technique of his voice in general like and the post-production like the mixing the production of his voice and then there's the way that the voice lands in the entirety of the room so more of like the overall mix Mm -hmm. and with the and the final mix with the music involved too and just the way that those all the different um parts of the sound track compete with each other and you can tell the preference is really in the dialogue. Like the music you can barely hear, even though, you know, it's giving us hints of duel of the fates. You can unfortunately (laughs) barely hear it because you just hear, hear you just hear the like very uncannily crisp, loud, boomy voice of Maul. And then, so, Oh, go ahead. 
Oh, no, I was going to say, it's just like there's like three tiers of this mixing. There's Maul's voice, Kira, and the room. And then right, the music Kira. was just like, oh, right, we have this track. Oh, Let's yeah, just slip that in just yeah. very, very like subtly there is it a major theme don't worry about it just 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 put it put it put it under they'll 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 get it (laughs) so going back to in universe um ideas about what is happening here or like what must have happened in order to make this work so we mall would have had to have a very crispy a very crisp um but sound um like miking situation he would have Mm -hmm. had to have everything very close mic'd like he both both his a, a mic very close to his mouth to catch the whole boom of his mouth and, you know, the proximity effect. And then there would have uh-huh. to be some sort of a mic that maybe, maybe a, like a boom mic or something. I don't know, just like a mic to capture the sound of his force <laughs> lightsaber being forced. Yeah, being probably you have for- that contact mic that, 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 uh, that, <laughs> that just travels the contact with the lightsaber. mic that is just stuck on to the it's lightsaber. It's got a mobile contact, uh, like a Yeah, it's a wireless contact. contact. Yeah. 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 Okay. It, it just lives on the lightsaber. And, yeah. um, and, and uh, everything would have to be going direct in through like an interface, which is yep. transmitting the whole signal of his call together. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, well, we don't know. We don't know. Here's the thing about Star Wars, though. Like when they have an Omni mic, they could really mean like an Omni mic, right? Like in Star it, Wars. Like, like that mic, that mic has the ability to catch, you know, close mic, everything in proximity to it, plus the whole room, plus everything. Right. Um I, I was mean, joking with a, a friend of mine uh, in a studio when we were like, I was doing a lot of different percussion and moving around from instrument to instrument. I was like, I was like, maybe in the distant future, though, invent some type of like room microphone that like just is like is. And it's just like in the room. And no matter what you play in the room, it like perfectly like it can adapt <laughs> to everything you play. It's like it like adjusts its own gain. And it's like no, it just mics the whole room perfectly. You know, I was like, wouldn't that be wonderful that we'd have to move all these mics around all the time? Like we could just I could just walk around this room and I just play and it just records it perfectly, you know, and then just um, but, but doesn't pick up like your right. lip smacking and everything. Yeah, right, exactly. yeah, yeah. that would like, be so great. I was like, in, I'd be like in a hundred 200 years that's what the future of recording will be it's like you know you just like it'll just be a room you walk into it's a recording room you know and it's like you know, so and nice. it's like and everything is just perfectly recorded you don't have to set up a million mics and have cables oh running everywhere oh my god um, in my recording projects uh, in you know at school it, like if i booked a three-hour session in the recording studio the first 90 minutes would be me just trying to set up the microphone oh my god and yeah, so yeah. Yeah, and, and the last it, half hour is and it would tear it down. Up. So really, yeah, exactly. Yeah, you, you really oh my god! And then minutes. I just like, you can barely you can, even get in the zone. Yeah, and ideally you could like you could adjust the proximity in post. Yeah, right? like, kind, oh. kind of like what you do with a VST. You know, like you like you can adjust, adjust the mic right. when. Right? Oh my yeah, goodness! You can go back. You you can go back in time in post production. That would be that would save wow. us all a lot of trouble. Um, but yeah. also okay. But going back to this, like. Um, First of all, what's funny about what you said, James, is that technology does sometimes um, take inspiration from sci-fi. Not that Star Wars is like a true sci-fi or whatever. So sure. it's it just it's funny that like what was probably a joke is probably um, I don't know probably will be true at some point. So okay, so in addition to the close miking situation and um, the whole perfect mix of Maul's transmission, hologram transmission. The other end of that is that Kira, in order, because we, the audience, are in the room with Kira. So we would, Kira or Dryden's office would ostensibly need to be decked out with the finest sound system capable of hearing Maul's message. So, you know, because it goes, you you have to have both ends for it to come out like that. Um, So Dryden's office would have to have been like, equipped and like already have everything like with surround sound speakers like subwoofer like just a whole a whole setup i don't know and don't let know me why. just say let me just say as someone who's worked briefly and on and off in broadcasting the most amazing broadcasting system where nothing is dropped everything gets there <laughs> everything is decoded right back theoretically intergalactically <laughs> <laughs> um, are there any like significant flickers of the hologram in this scene like does the hologram at all show any type of indication of ha- of it being like a 
some type of aesthetically, you know, like it, it, like a received message and has that aesthetic to it? Or is it like, does he not waver? Because I know that in other hologram scenes, you get a little like flick, flick, right? Right. Um, the hologram itself really... is pretty wavery. Oh, I showed up the wrong image earlier. Okay, well, here it is. Okay. Um, his hologram, like the image isn't that great, but the audio is just great. It's, the it's, audio is fantastic. Yeah. It's kind of like these podcasts that I, that I do with you. Uh, like my video, my video is usually <laughs> awful, and my audio is great. Uh, uh, that's very true. Um, yeah. Um, so, yeah, the odd. It's it's maybe that's something that makes it feel even more uncanny to hear. Is Harrison's maybe because it looks vanilla ice hair right there. Because it looks like that. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see it in the middle of the screen. I just put it up. You can see Maul with his hand outstretched. Um, yep. mm -hmm. and, and you see Woody Harrelson looking like Vanilla Ice to the right as well. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so, yeah. After those he are... got iced. Ha, 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 ha. So those are our thoughts on, uh, on the mixing of Maul. Um, I go crazy when I hear a Valacor and a hi-hat <laughs> with a souped-up tempo. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> okay, let's continue listening to, to the situation. Know. And, you know, maybe we'll hear even some of the Duel of the Fates in the background, maybe. Closely, from now on. Like here you can hear. And that was the Phantom Menace hologram, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. that's cool. So um, the f Duel of the Fates-ness um here... Let's. Uh, ha would you like to listen to that without the dialogue, so we can actually? Yeah, let's go. Let's go back a little. Bit. Oh, you mean you, uh, can, uh, let's hear it where we can, uh, where it's audible? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can actually, recognize what it's doing. Uh -huh, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, sounds. Sounds good. Okay. And what's interesting too is that this track can only be found in the deluxe edition Correct. soundtrack of the the release soundtrack, and not in the uh, non. Deluxe, which at that point I just say release, yeah, the deluxe, and not call oh. it deluxe and just call it the soundtrack. But you know that's yeah, you know, this is the track called myself. Malls Call <laughs> slash Parting Ways. Okay. It's so interesting. So that's the theme. Duel the Fates theme. Dee, 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 dee. You dee, 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 dee. And then this is the chant theme from Duel of the Fates. So the only thing it's missing is the ostinato. Right. But it has two of the three like main themes. Which we laughed about that being kind of, that would be silly if they played a slow, because this is a slower tempo, obviously, of the mm -hmm. original version. Uh, it would be kind of silly to have that ostinato. Like going, right? It would be a little on the nose. Um, you, know what, you know what I realized about this? You know, I really, I did some analysis myself. And I, what I realized about this scene is that this actually has slightly different chord changes and harmonies uh, than the original version. I, mm -hmm. I did this analysis myself and uh, no one told me this. Um, uh, that I noticed about this, about this, is that there's a different harmony <laughs> structure to this. You, you, you knew this? You, 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 you did this? I, <laughs> you. I'm just kidding. Just, just, for, just for clarification, Justin made the very, very when we originally... <laughs> Justin, was, when we originally... Here, like, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah, wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> so... So, sorry, just to clarify, so, people are what, really confused. What were those yeah. chord changes, Justin James? originally came yeah, why don't you, <laughs> James, yeah, why don't, don't you explain no, no, no. it? What were, the, what were those chord changes again? Tell, remind me. I feel like I need ones. to make sure we're going to be losing people if we keep doing the inside <laughs> joke thing. Uh, when we originally recorded this, Justin pointed out some really interesting differences, and I was just pretending to take credit for that uh, now that we're re-recording it. So, so Justin, uh, enlighten us. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Well, thank you for that. Uh, <laughs> no, no, uh, uh, yeah, the uh, uh, specifically with the chant kind of a thing. So we know the original track of Duel the Fates famously starts with 
probably the most epic choir out of Carmina Burana's O Fortuna or Verdi's Requiem, if you're familiar with those immensely epic choir parts <laughs> uh, to, totally. to an orchestra. But it starts, uh, the original Duel of the Fates kind of... Is, Would you like me to play it? Uh, uh, yeah. If you've got it, if you've got I it do. up. I do. I do. Okay. Okay, I'll stop there. Did that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, exactly. Um, it's it's uh, uh, it's got this kind of obviously this big minor chord E minor. Kind of gets into this like yeah. kind of suspendy mm-hmm. kind of thing. I'll play it up the octave. Where this one, uh, it has of, this through line note. It has what is it? You said E minor. That's an E. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's like, like a, both, it keeps that E, that ma throughout. Yeah, that. and the B up up on top, so and it keeps B. this 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 the to- kind of the just, tonic root and fifth just keep keep as a pedal throughout that whole thing, right? Yeah, and all we're really moving is this. Right. Where this version in solo, they allude to that by starting with the. Uh, same E minor, but they move the whole chord around, which uh, is kind of gives it almost a more, I don't know, classical resolution. Let's hear it. Wait, let's hear it. Let's hear in it. In a way. This is from solo. It sounds pretty close. It's close. It's I'm close. not hearing that E, though. I'm not hearing the E on the second chord. Right. No, it changes. I, I feel like what I... What I got through the mm-hmm. it goes to a dominant chord either a, a diminished mm-hmm. seven quarter or a five chord right does yeah. a little something like that which is, which we don't have this note in that chord anywhere anymore we have this chord note in that chord we have the leading exactly. tone exactly so the, basically, the Mall's Call version, the solo version, is, the chord is suspensions are less of a feature of those chords, and the mm-hmm. chords are more clear, really yeah. defined. Exactly, they're less comp- like complex, like with you know added, like in, yeah. In some ways, they sound. And, and also the inversion. I, the inversions are, feel very different too. Yeah. And I because, feel like yeah. maybe, maybe early, um, maybe like Renaissance, maybe um, choir liturgical music would not necessarily have that firm. Um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, leading tone. It would have that suspension. There's a lot of suspensions in, in cluster, uh, closer uh, clusters in the in vocal music. I'd say that sounds a little older to me, to the original mm-hmm. version, the original version with the, the, the way the cor- choir is arranged, as opposed to something a little bit more later classical, which would probably not do a suspension. I mean, not, not, not this is definitely not a rule. I'm just mm-hmm. saying like one of them sounds a little bit more later classical. One of them sounds like more early music. And so yeah. to me, and you're saying my, like, the William, Williams sounds more early and Powell exactly. sounds more late. So isn't that kind of cool? Like the early version mm-hmm. sound, it yeah. sounds, uh, I mean, this is not on purpose, but it's kind of, <laughs> it's kind of cool that, that, that some earlier in the timeline, it, it, the music sounds to my, in just out, out of my, like, I just came up with this idea right now, uh, version, it sounds earlier. And then this one sounds a little bit more like a range classical. There's like harp in it, you know, I don't know. So don't here's, know. okay, here, I want to, let's, I want to compare the two one more. Again, okay, so let's listen to the original Duel of the Fates. Yeah, it almost sounds like Gregorian chant or something. Okay, I think the voice leading there, I think I think the bass notes there make it sound way different because even though we're in, we're in E minor, the bass note is a G, so... Where it's already mm-hmm. first inversion. It's... Here, let's, let's, let's play. 
Doo-doo is so it goes. Doo doo da 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 do do do. Yeah, it goes dee 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 dee. You know what I mean? It's like dee 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 dee. Yeah. So like the root note or like the bass, you know, the lowest voice isn't singing the root of the, the root. chord. So like oh. the uh, inversions really make it like they really give it a different feeling. Okay, let's listen. Well, it's fresh. Let's listen to the solo. It's this chord that sounds so different, huh? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It almost sounds... Yeah. Is that a four chord? No, it's a five chord. Is no, it... it's a two. It's a two chord? Two, di- two diminished. Yeah, natural mm-hmm. to the minor key. Um, yeah, that sounds like more sounds... like a like, uh, Handel to me. Uh, and I'd say like the original sounds something more in the order of like just can or something like that. Like something... You know, um, also, oh, yeah, yeah, it I, just sounds it sounds like uh, it, th- the second version sounds way more um, like classical uh, religious music, uh, classical era religious music. I think it sounds, it, I think it reminds me of uh, Mozart, Mozart Requiem, the Lacrimosa, Requiem, right? We said, yeah, yeah, the Lacrimosa uh, in, yeah, in the previous yeah. recording because the, um, the and it might also be the whole leading tone thing because, like. The voices obviously is one part of it. I don't know. I can just imagine the like lacrimosa kind of like. Yeah. Because lacrimosa is like. It's like a lot of, you know, the the meter of it is like is different, but it does have a lot of those like. Toward the end of the measure, these little sighs, mm. what, you know. Um, yeah. I also like think this. the harp adds this like, it's it's a, it's pretty it's like pretty modern. It's almost like trip hoppy, because uh, the harp. Oh, and the bass. That's another thing. The bass line. It kind of adds. There's like some funky bass here, not funky, but like, <laughs> you know. D D D. D, 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 D. Mm. So it's kind of adding some subtle pulse. Like it, it, it's definitely, it feels more like you could expand that and you could remix that into like a dance track. Totally. The, the bass is like, yeah. What's the boom, original boom. key of the, ori- of the first one? What key is that? First e, one is? e minor. Is it in the same... It's mm-hmm. both in E minor. Mm-hmm. Can we listen to the original one more time? Yep. Should I play it for uh, longer this time? No. J- yeah. Uh, just just the first two phrases. Okay. Like da 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 da. Oh, yeah. It does do a diminished. It's really the. That voicing is just, it's, it makes all the difference. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 It's really interesting. Yeah. Cool. I'm actually, I'm really glad we re re recorded this section. Cause we're taught we're, we're breaking this up, this particular moment up in, in a lot more care detail. Yeah. 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 Making, making, a lot more care. More, much more interesting <laughs> things than we did the first time around. Yeah. So I, I'm agreed. actually very glad we're talking. About <laughs> yeah. <this>. Agreed. <laughs> yeah. Um, Yes, I'm on my new computer. So yeah, our when our last recording crashed, that was my last straw where I was like, I need to move all my stuff to the new computer at least so we can, because I couldn't actually hear what I was playing back to you. So like I wasn't even able to comment really because I was just hearing glitchiness. Mm. That's why I kept asking, is it glitchy? Mm. So I was just letting you you guys do the talking for uh, the music stuff, um, which, you know, not great. So, um, I mean, great, but like not oh. great when... Oh, no. <laughs> I mean, oh, not no. great. <laughs> you know what I mean. 
Not, oh, geez. Let not guys. great when I have, <laughs> don't have a handle of the of my own podcast. <laughs> handle to re- no, rein us back in. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, I was just letting Let's you all Google. say all wrong stuff. No, I'm just kidding. All um, the wrong things. Yeah, all of the wrong things. What? Yeah, I. What do we think about it maintaining the key of the original? You think that was on, that was probably on purpose, right? Hey, um, maybe I don't really have deep thoughts on I don't it. Know. Yeah, I mean, I, I I know lots of people have ve- lots of very like strong opinions on key, and and yeah. uh, mm-hmm. I don't honestly, and, and that's as someone that like doesn't even have, like barely has relative perfect pitch. Like I know people that like have perfect pitch only on their instruments. Where they like you, like you, you're in at the mall with them or something. Be like, sing an E. They're like, I can't. But then all of a sudden they're on their instrument and they're like, sing an E. And they're like, Bruh. right. Um, but I, uh, I, uh, and then I, of course, know people that can do the, 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 the former, right. Um, and I can't do any of those things, right. Um, you know, because I started out on drums. Um, <laughs> I really attribute it to that, actually. I really do. Well, I do Um, have feeling, I do have strong feelings about key sometimes, but it like so depends on the context. Yeah, I might, I have a strong uh, feeling about key when I, when I'm composing something and I'm putting it in different keys. I'm like, oh, actually, I like it in this key better than the other. That, I, that's kind of the extent where that comes in. But there's people that are literally like, like, I like I, G minor really is like really brings out these feelings to me. And I'm like, I'm just don't, my brain's not wired that way. Um, so I'm curious. I, I think I'm curious it does for me depending on the instrument. But do you think that, I mean, I, I mean, I don't really know. This is more projection, but I, I, I or like, sorry. Um, this is more like a speculation, but I'm like, do you, do you think that the, that that sits, especially with now knowing how low in the mix it is. Do you think that having it in that key, like, significantly strengthens the audience's like our recollection and nostalgia factor for like what they remember hearing from this like and do you think that like helped with that moment as opposed to putting it in a different key and that like do you think that i don't know do we think in another universe do you think that that putting it in a different key like would have made a, a, a would have weakened the connection i almost same musical I, material I, but different key. yeah I don't have also don't have a very strong association with key. I think if it, it yeah. works, it works kind of a thing. But at the yeah. same time, I, I get it. Like when I hear a song that I know in a different key, I'm like, why does this sound different? You know, kind of yeah. a thing. And it takes me, oh, because they dropped it a whole step or whatever. Like, oh, yeah. that's, an, you know, but that's kind of like the extent of my thought about this. Where this hearing that I, I think, yes, hearing that E minor or whatever, in another world, it could have been A minor. It could have been whatever it is. Like, hearing that in its original makes you go, oh, ha, ha, it's the Darth yeah. Maul theme kind yeah, of a thing. Yeah, like yeah. if he had come in with a, uh, instead of, all of a sudden we get, yeah. I just dropped it a whole step into <clears throat> D minor, the saddest of all keys, D minor. Yeah, see, right, people you know, say, um, <laughs> well, we'll do that, you know, most ominous, uh, the, the Hans Zimmer key, D minor. Um, it's, uh, that would sound different. It just, it, it, it's still like, I'd still probably go, oh, it's the Darth Maul theme, but it, it'd be, until I went and researched it, I wouldn't think of why it was different, just knowing that it sounded different. They used it in a different context. Um, so yes. Yeah. Okay, so my thoughts are, <clears throat> so I think I do have maybe stronger feelings about keys than, than I made it seem like before, but like I think that having it in the same key subconsciously probably helped or helped certain audience members make the connection but I think like Justin when you just played instead of E minor like D minor I think if you were to you know like if you if you were to then play the theme in D minor I think if you asked people to self-report on which one I think people would say like both are fine. Like I think people, yeah. so I, I don't think people would re- yeah. would realize would have a preference. But I think just doing it without uh, without like. But I wonder if you asked those same people, hey, if you played both of them to them and said which one sounds more like the original, and you literally only changed the key, I wonder what people would subconsciously be able to gravitate towards. See, That's I would I think would I, I think curious. if we were to if we were to organize an experiment like that, yeah. Um, 
to test like e, uh, this theme coming in in E minor, the original, or D minor. I think yeah. it would have to be like something where people don't talk, where people don't self-report. I think it would have to be like something where you, um, like a double blind situation where you play the scene and just play it with one version and then you me like measure the reaction times to like people recognizing it. Um, oh, you mean with, to like their, get their brain waves on this? <laughs> no, no, no. I, I mean, mean like you just measure like how long it takes them for them to pe to place what theme, what oh, theme that is. To, like, so like to see if people it hearing it in E minor notice it faster than people hearing it in D minor. Cause then, and then, I don't know, it'd be interesting to also then collect like what they say afterward. Yeah. Cause then maybe they're, yeah. what, maybe what they say yeah, if doesn't you were line testing, up. If you were testing, a, like, this is, we're going so a, a lovingly in the weeds on this, this thing. Uh, uh, so yeah, if you were testing, like what's more effective in making them recognize it. But I also think a, a different question that's slightly different question is like, which do you think is the original, right? Um, mm. Right, which is like playing both of them back to back and be like pick. But here's the thing: they might have a bias of hearing one first than the other, right? Mm -hmm. And their brain might just be like, "That's what I remember." And then the yeah, other that's why like, no, you would have to mix up that, which ones. Right? You'd have to get this a lot of participants. To me. You would have to mix up which one you play first, and then yeah. just okay, yeah. So if we were okay, so if we're designing this study, then we're playing the scene with either the E minor version or the D minor version, and then. One version is just seeing how how long it takes there for them to place it, and then and they're like mm -hmm. afterward they can fill out this thing that's like, you know, do you know or first of all what it what have you identified, and then second of all, mm -hmm. like, would it do you think it would have mattered, and then play the alternative or like play the alternative and say which one you know reminds you of it more, which one do you think is the original or, yeah. or, or whatnot, because I think people, even people hearing the D minor version say all the D minor vert people, let's just say the average reaction time is like 25% slower. Let's just say, I, I, okay. I think yeah, even, let's just say that, let's yeah. just say that even if those people had a 25% slower reaction time, if, even if it took them like 10 seconds to place what it was, I think yeah. that wouldn't matter to them individually. They would still feel like, Oh yeah, I knew it. And they would answer it with confidence. Like I knew yeah. this, like, yeah, this was, you know, it wouldn't so have mattered. There are so many variables in this exper hypothetical experiment that I can't imagine. Because you also have to like take in like how experienced they are with Star Wars and like, you know, like, and that, the, and, or like how, when was the last time they saw the Phantom Menace and like all these crazy variables would like make it very difficult to test two different groups. Because obviously you couldn't test, this is, I, I think we're going too, too mm -hmm. far with this whole thing, but, uh, but, but, but no, I think it's actually think. super relevant to star Wars music in, in, yeah. in particular. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. Okay, good. I'm, well, I'm glad the host has the seal of approval of this ridiculous uh, hypothetical experiment we've created, but, uh, but yeah, don't, like you obviously couldn't play both versions for the same group. Like if you had group a and group B and then a tr control group or whatever, I don't know. Uh, like group a would be the E minor group. Group B would be the D minor group. Um, and then like, what would the control be in this experiment? Like both of them, like you play both of them for those, those people, right? No, and, I don't know if there would be a control. Yeah. I don't know if that would, that would make sense in that context, but yeah, you, like you, how could you make sure that group A and group B have like identical other variables? No, you right? can't. Which was like, no, no, of course not. Like, like you can't. But and that's that, what but I'm that saying. But that wouldn't matter. Are so... Or no. It you don't might, think might. it would matter? No, no, no. I mean, I, I think it depends on what we're trying to ultimately measure. Let's say we're like, maybe the composer has a team of people being like, okay, what, what key should we do this in or whatever? And yeah. it's just, yeah, yeah, yeah. and they're just like, which one will get the best reaction time? And so you, because your audience is naturally going to be very diverse anyway, it, I think it yeah. would make sense to have a diverse testing pool. You'd have to have a very large sample size. Yeah, this, obviously. Like, yeah, <laughs> the yeah. better, the, yeah, ideally and, yeah, and then you'd study. probably have to have somebody be like, why did we spend all this money on this, ex on this strange <laughs> right. Yeah. No one's uh, going to do this experiment. experiment. <laughs> no, I, mean, um, I would do this stuff if I was rich. I, I would just fund these types of things. You know the other thing I would fund? No, I, I, I actually I was, do think universities might, if you know, like if someone wants, like if a student wants yeah, to pitch sure. this sort of thing, like I'm interested. Yeah. Well, I if I was rich, here's the other thing I would do. I, uh, first of all, if I was rich, it, um, and it was because I made like a top forty hit. Okay, here's what I would do: is just to mess with people, I would uh, release it all my my song on Spotify. It gets really popular and famous, right? And then maybe like two weeks in, or three weeks, four a month into it being charted, I would just like replace all the files 
with a new mix of it, like in a <laughs> no, no. Half step up, and just see if anyone notices. Like, don't even tell anybody. Be like, hey, that's that song that where everyone loves is like sounds a little different these days. Um, you know, I just replace it on YouTube, on Spotify, on Bandcamp, everywhere, and just see what happens. Like, wouldn't that be crazy? It'd be like the Berenstain Bears of 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 keys. Oh, uh, like sweet. you'd be like, I, was that song always in A flat major? Are you talking about the spelling? Yeah, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know the, the Mandela the effect name. of like everyone mm. remembering a different version of something. So everyone I think like in a different key. the thing with I think almost the recency in which one has heard a song would not even wouldn't matter as much as how ingrained it was initially wired into them, like maybe in childhood or something. Like I think. I think the wiring, I mean, I yeah, don't know, but, like, yeah. I'm, I'm speculating, but I'm just saying, like, you know, sometimes when people... If it's a big theme like that, for sure, yeah. Or, or mm-hmm. not necessarily if it's a big theme, but, like, if they listened to it over, if they have listened to it over and over and over, and it's, like, sure. just, you know, some things just have, make their way into your subconscious, like, into your body, where, you're like, you, you're not even consciously thinking, like, you almost make the right, you almost, like, just... Would, would hum it and you know how like some people even non-musicians yeah. will sometimes hum a song and like without any awareness of like pitch or the, like they don't even know what key signatures are like oftentimes they'll hum it like actually in a pretty close key if not sure. the right key and it, and that always strikes me as really that always strikes me as really fascinating and I think it's just like this it's part of it right? it's it's drawing from this like subconscious like then if you make them think about it too much then they'll like you know it'll all topple over and they'll be like I don't I don't know but just mm-hmm. instinctively, I think people have like a a, a really a more attuned um, sensory like memory than they even realize. Like also with smells, also think about like video totally. game sound mm-hmm. design. Like sometimes when people hear sound, they're like it instantly triggers something where they're they're like they've had wired into them from a, the video ga- a video game and stuff like that. Yeah. So totally. anyway, all that is yeah, to say, I, yeah, I think that that's the important part because I yeah. I would say that if you played this so- Han Solo theme for me, even as a massive. Uh, Star Wars fan and a musician, if you played Han Solo's main theme for me, like right now, I'd be like, that's Han Solo's theme. A month from now, if you played it for me, I'd be like, that's a Star Wars theme and I don't remember what it's from. Um, That's what I would say because that's how little I'm actually familiar with that theme. Um, So recency on a theme like that for me. Well, yeah, because it hasn't been ingrained yet. Exactly. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm saying. And so some people actually might, I think this particular theme is ubiquitous enough where it's like, yeah. Uh, it's like people mostly know that. Um, how yeah. are, I mean, you might have casual fans that mean like, I know that's from Star Wars, but I don't remember what part of Star Wars. There, I mean, you might be surprised at how how many people outside of the geekdom probably might not realize that's like the Darth Maul part of Star Wars. You know? Yeah, but people um, seeing Solo would probably definitely know this theme, especially since agreed, agreed. especially yeah, yeah, since yeah, yeah, yeah. the thing that makes Duel of the Fate so memorable, and we'll talk about this more in Phantom Menace season. Also, I'll put a link in the show notes. I did a whole like episode with live action Star Wars YouTube or podcast about Duel of the mm-hmm. Fates. Um, so is the fact that the song, it's, it's not just a theme, like a motif that is just woven into a lot of things. It's like Duel of the Fates was crafted as like a song. Like it's like yeah. a it's like a full on song, and it was like uh, made into a music video that was on I think premiered on TRL TRL or like one of those like MTV type oh, yeah, things. So like it was actually totally like live. so yeah, it actually was like handled almost like a pop charting like song. Right. So that also major would... marketing force of this movie for sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And and but well, you know what we actually haven't talked about since we've done the re-recording is the fact that this isn't really Darth Maul's theme, right? Like right. it's not like technically yeah. his theme, but it's associated with him, right? Um, and that's kind of an interesting point. I mean, it's probably the closest according thing to that Dave Filoni could ex- could expect. According to, to Dave be... Filoni, right? Oh, I'm right. sorry. Uh, according uh, to Dave Filoni, that it's not his the... theme. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, right, because, yeah, the whole like it's the dust fighting over the you know the destiny of Anakin. Right, right, right. Exactly. But, I mean, and, even so, I mean, the name of the the, the the track is like "Duel of the Fates," and usually John Williams when he makes a theme for somebody, like the title is some it if not a direct reference to the thing that it's it's a theme for. It's like like Star Cross Lovers is about these two specific characters. It's not like the scene that it happens in. It's not like Retreat on Naboo. It's star cross lovers. Like this is a this is a theme about their love, or or literally Princess Leia's theme. Like John Williams usually titles his stuff 
in a way like this is like duel of the fates. This is not about Maul. This is about this duel, right? Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Right. Am I, am I? Am I? Is that like not a? Is that no? A I think you're right. Like a I think you're right. To make? No, I think you're right so because I, also people forget that like motifs aren't just things that are associated with characters. Like motifs yeah. are also associated with ideas. And yeah, scenes, things, like the right. for like well although although the force was Ben's theme but like uh, you know whatever other other stuff like that right. it doesn't always have to be just like a character yeah my point is like if John Williams intended this to be like Darth Maul's theme he would have probably named it like the Horned Menace or like Maul's theme or like he would make it he would probably title it something that indicates that it's Darth Maul's theme right right I don't and, think he's then- yeah. Sorry, I was just going to say, and then the next time we hear it before the solo movie is in Attack of the Clones when Anakin Skywalker yes. is rushing across on the speeder bike, rushing yes. across Tatooine to confront the uh, the uh, uh, sand people, the Tuscans, for uh, capturing, you know, in, taking, yep. take, ki- kidnapping, that's the word, kidnapping his mother. We hear Duel of the Fates then has nothing to right. do with Maul. But I think um, we're attributing too much um, to John Williams himself in... in his intention in because he, I don't intention. think he, I don't, he, I don't think he was thinking about all of these things when he, when he wrote it, like the title is like the last thing. I think he intended it to be the theme for that specific battle for that yeah, specific what, duel absolutely. with yeah, Maul, right. Qui-Gon and Kenobi without it being, and it could have, you know, depending on how storytellers decided to like emphasize one aspect of it or like, or whatever, then it could come back later. But I think like the meaning kind of grew over time. Like it, it wasn't, you know, all, yeah. all. But think about how powerful that can be. The fact that. Oh, absolutely. It's totally despite valid. The, the, despite the fact that it wasn't about Maul in particular, we can associate this theme with Maul so powerfully now we, that we put it back in this. It's yeah. like when, uh, when uh, Xanthi, we were, we did the episode on um, The Last Jedi where we had the big Snoke uh, uh, thing, and we had this whole thing about Palpatine's, uh, like what I have associated since the beginning as Palpatine's theme from Return of the Jedi, all of a sudden appear during Snoke's force power kind of a thing, to which we do not yet know that it's actually Palpatine behind the scenes. And I made this whole conspiracy theory, like this was a drop of like a big hint that yeah. somehow got past <laughs> the things. And Xanthi was like, no, it's just, it has nothing to do with that. But it's like, but we've taken such a theme that only played when the emperor was on screen. Oh my gosh. We're not getting into that again. Through, I, I know. I'm just <laughs> well, saying. Well, here's the thing is like, <laughs> as we all, it's well documented that sequels were incredibly and intricately planned from the very beginning. Um, yes. <laughs> yes. Oh, Did I say goodness. prequels? I meant sequels. Yeah. You, you know, I, I know exactly <laughs> what you meant. But, yeah, um, I didn't land that joke the way I wanted to. I guess uh, another happy point, landing. I, actually, this is kind of an interesting thing, though. This is this is almost like the opposite of what happened with Obi-Wan's theme. Like, Obi-Wan's mm. theme was originally tr- attributed to Obi-Wan and became something more general in, uh, in its usage elsewhere. This is something that was more general to begin with, and now is being attributed specifically to a character. See, I don't think it was more um, general to begin with. I think this was very specifically specific to begin with, and it became, and now it's... But it's, I, no, I mean, it's, but not as specific as Darth Maul. That's what I'm saying. I think it it's generally almost... generally specific. That, that's I think generally it's, specific I'm not saying it wasn't specific to the scene. Narrow. Sure, it was specific to the scene and to the duel. Great. Yeah, I think but with there's the th- duel but there's with Darth three Maul. people in that duel. Now it's being attributed. I know, to but person. I think I, I know there are three people in the duel, but like I don't think that and go Qui Gon, like equally Qui Gon, equally Qui Gon, Obi Wan, and Darth Maul. Like the the standout, like the really special part of that duel yeah. is Maul. So like I know I agree that it's not just Darth Maul's theme, but I do think like that theme is out of. If I had to pick any easy character to associate that with, I would say definitely Darth Maul. And that's also because of the future uses, usages of the theme, even though there have been like a couple, like, like Justin mentioned, like it's not like the, it's not like Ben's theme, which the force theme ended up being used a ton. So it was easy to gener- generify this theme, mm-hmm. like didn't show up in the sequel. Like it didn't really show up in the sequels. It like didn't even, it hasn't really shown up that much. And so the lasting yeah. impression that we have still is like Darth Maul. E- yeah. yeah. In fact, I don't think I didn't even remember when I watched that. Um, it was probably that video about Filoni talking about this or it was something else. 
Um, I didn't even remember that they put it in Attack of the Clones, like, like until I was in, reminded of it in that moment. I was like, oh, I guess they did do that. I didn't even notice um, because I do associate it with Maul. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think it's a stretch to say that it is slightly more specific here than it was used originally. Um, uh, and regardless, this is now, it, it was wise to do it, to do it that way, right? And in our previous recording of this, we mentioned a number of different other ways that this has happened, right? Like there's the, we talked about the X-Men theme being used in mm-hmm. Doctor, the new Doctor Strange movie to kind of n- notate, you know, a, a Professor X's arrival. Um, so it's, 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 it's powerful. It worked. Good job. And if this was the, <laughs> and, yeah. And if this was the first time that you're seeing Darth Maul since, Phantom Menace, like if you did not watch any of the Clone Wars or Rebels or any of the other things that had his entire from then up until now, <laughs> what yeah. what's been going on? Yeah, and then it was helpful and music, you know, can be helpful. helpful. And let me just yeah. let me just again with the title thing, real quick, just to d- defend Justin in the in the we've got a lot of li- a lot of little <laughs> mini arguments happening here. It's great, uh, J- Justin. Uh, I mean, that theme is called the Emperor in Return of the Jedi. You know, like, yeah. Yeah. Like it's titled just, the Emperor. Just, just, yeah, not yeah. just like a, it's not just like a dark spooky man. Oh no, no, no. Right? No, no, no. That you no, you're misunderstanding. I think that theme I'm not is... misunderstanding. I'm just being purposefully uh antagonistic. Oh, okay. Um. <laughs> well then. That's fine. You can do that. Um, okay. We should probably move on from doing Yep, we're gonna move on from doing the now. We went pretty thorough on that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so um after Duel of the Fates, okay, so for if we're going in, you know, the the five sections that I sort of think um this this set of five minutes can be broken down into musically, um, now we are into part five, which is Beckett and Han. Mm. Uh, and maybe we'll just um we'll just drop right in there to listen to that. Um and I'll start right here. Okay. End of the hologram. That's a very, that's such a classic like Star Wars transition. So sinister. So now you can hear the rustling. You can tell we're in a different place. See now, here the dialogue sounds more natural. Kill him? Mm-hmm. You still don't get it, do you, kid? It was never about you. She's a survivor. You know what your problem is? You think everybody's like you. Not you, kid. Did you hear that? That's where I that I heard the dee dee. Mm-hmm. Which I think is unintentional, but it probably is. But it is a coincidence that it sounds like. Kira kill him? Still don't get it, do you, kid? It was never about you. She's a survivor. You know what your problem is? You think everybody's Coming like up. you? Here. Not you, kid. You're nothing like me. It's so I'll play it without the dialogue after this. Pretty but subtle, yeah. I hope you're still paying this attention is... because now I'm going to tell you the most important. Ah, uh, yep. So, yeah, mix here, right? We've we've been we've been talking about the. Mix what do you think of the mix well. here? So that that moment where he, uh, you know, listening to the tr- the track that this is on, which is uh, what's the name of the track? It's um. Um, um, it, we're still it's on. Or Maul's, it's yeah. still Maul's call, right? Yeah, because yeah, it's, it's Mar- Maul's call slash parting ways. So the parting right. ways parting portion. Ways. So yeah, this moment in the score is like a huge build up and poof, like a big uh, uh, attacks to kind of attack from the orchestra with some silence afterwards, right? But that gets really drowned out by the sound design in this moment. Um, the shooting specifically. The shooting specifically, and I almost want to say the shooting happens like a little earlier, just like a split second earlier than the actual attack in the score. Um, and it's almost like they cut out, they might have like actually clipped the attack 
for uh, in the in the score, but then left it on for the soundtrack. Like to hmm. like, and I'll and I'll tell you the wait, reason why I, I know wait, this. Can you, can you clarify what you mean by this? Yeah, let me ta- let me explain. So uh, the the reason why I know this because I've been I've been I I downloaded the video from the from the scene, put it in iMovie, and then I put over the sound uh, the soundtrack audio and aligned it with the with the video so that I could mute the original from the movie and then up where the soundtrack and just listen to the mm. soundtrack over the muted audio. Um, and I, what I noticed is that the, I believe that the blaster shot is a split second earlier than the orchestra's arrival of that boom hit. Okay. And meaning that, and I, but I don't hear in the actual score, uh, in the movie, in the final product, I don't hear like a of the or like laser orchestra. I don't hear that. Uh, sorry, blaster orchestra. I don't hear like an offset. What it sounds like to me is what they did is they literally cut the orchestra's attack, uh, that staccato attack, Ooh. Um, out and only made the blaster sound. Like, I don't hear, I don't know if you've got the soundtrack only version of this, Xanthi, the track. No, we're going to um, compare. We're going to compare for sure. We're going yeah, to, to, to hear about to hear about I that. do not hear the big attack in the original, uh, in, the, in, the, in the movie. Like, I don't hear, I only hear the blaster. I hear a slight swell into it, but I don't hear the, uh, bam. I don't even. Yeah, I don't, I don't hear, hear that it. either. Could just be like very low in the mix of it. But to my knowledge, when I lined it up, I'm like, that actually doesn't happen right with the with the blaster. I it thought happened. it was intentional. I thought like, because listening to it even just now, I'm like, interesting how like they have the orchestra crescendoing, you know, getting louder. And then the blaster fire Cut too soon. cuts it. Well, I don't know if it cuts off too soon, but the blaster fire like intercept like it cuts off the crescendo like and i feel like that not too makes soon, it more meaning sus- it's a bad choice but it's like well it meaning like, like the music is misleading you into thinking you have more time and the blaster yeah. fire hmm. cuts you off so it, it the music kind of helps create the suspense by making it artificially cut off quote unquote too yeah soon. That, that's i guess so it's, yeah to my point it was just like like it sound like they they literally seeming like cut it and don't let the the crescendo that was performed can like actually finish um, because the crescendo that's performed like is a little it telegraphs what's about to happen a little bit more clearly than in the movie. In the movie, you're just like, oh, whoa, whoa what just happened there, right? Yeah, and which I and, think is the desired effect. Cre- and it's created by this effect, I think. And that's yeah. what I'm, I guess what I'm saying is like when I listen to the, the track, I'm like, I could see in the audio files, the blaster hit happens before the orchestra hit in the, in the soundtrack, right? Mm-hmm. Which, and you... Which leads me to believe that they actually muted the soundtrack at that moment, yeah. and, like cut the audio file. So. And and James, in this experiment, I'm curious. Like uh, we 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 know that the mixing of a lot of the music in this movie is so turned down. And when you listen to the soundtrack only version of this, it sounds loud. Like the 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 crescendo happens. It's a big yes. moment kind of yeah. a thing. D- did it affect? How did that affect your viewing, like in your experiment when just watching what the movie does and then putting the soundtrack underneath it and bumping it up a little bit? Uh, do you think it's more or less effective to have it so mixed down? Should we the, listen to I it? Think it's actually, yeah, go ahead. But I have an answer to that. Okay, go, you, uh, you can answer it first. Yeah. yeah, the answer would be like, I think it's actually more effective the way they did it in the movie because mm-hmm. I think it should come out of nowhere. Because that's the whole point is like you kind of feeling this from and this this is the moment where Han almost or where Beckett almost tells him the the meta joke which is like I'm about I'm gonna tell you one more thing always <laughs> shoot first right which is they needed to put some kind of reference to that in this movie and they did and they and I to my opinion they did in in kind of the best way they possibly could which is don't say it but imply it right. Um, and, uh, but you expect him to finish the sentence and he doesn't. And, and when you put, put the score in there, I'm not as surprised by his sentence being cut off. I'm, um, because it feels like, it kind of feels like it should be like a record scratch, which is, that's what it is. Mm-hmm. It's like, yeah, I shot you. Right. Um, and that's what the effect is. It's like, shut that music up. I'm going to shoot you. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's what happens. That's what I think that's what literally happens. Cut that music off. We'll put the and let's replace it with a blaster hit. So, okay, let's listen to it in the context of the film. She's a survivor. You know what your problem is? You think everybody's like you. Not you, kid. You're nothing like me. I hope you're still paying attention because now I'm going to tell you the most important. <laughs> yeah, yeah. God, it is so. It, okay, wait. You let's know what it reminds to me of? Mm-hmm. Sorry, sorry. 
there's two moments in orchestra repertoire for percussionists this reminds me of where I've seen both of these moments happen haphazardly in concert, and it's hilarious when it happens, <laughs> which is the canon canon hits in Tchaikovsky's uh, 1812. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, the hot, and the hammer in that one Mahler symphony, I don't it was it uh. seven or is it, uh, is it Mahler seven? Or is it, is some, someone tell me and correct me. But there's a huge hammer hit in Mahler. And I've, I've seen in rehearsal both of those moments in college happen way too early. <laughs> and it's hilarious when it does because it's a because it's like it's like da, 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 <laughs> like right like somebody pulls the <laughs> pulls the cannon too early and you can't like once that thing goes it's too early right <laughs> and that's 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 kind of like what this it's like almost like the person that was supposed to shoot the blaster as part of the score shot it like one second too early right and, and, this, and like oh man dude like you really ruined that moment right there but it's it creates an effect that's purposeful you know so. That's funny. Yeah. Okay, let's listen to it in the let's listen to it without the dialogue on the ch- soundtrack. I don't even recognize We're almost there. I mean, that, four seconds before that happens, you're like, something is about to happen. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so, is yeah, it even so the same? <laughs> some, I, I, I question this going back and forth. Is it even the same underscore? I think it is. It's just very it much is, yeah. more prominently mixed. It's... Seth, you made some really. Uh, I thought it was really cool to hear you break some of this down in your in your New Hope season. There was one episode I remember what it was. But you were really talking about the differences between like how they mix it for a soundtrack, how they perform it for a soundtrack. It's even possible that they that they have a completely different per, tr, tr, uh, take. Yep, they do. Than the, than the film, not always, often, but they do right? sometimes. Which mm-hmm. I actually didn't. I wasn't really aware of that. Before. No, I wasn't like, either like, until I talked yeah, to Erica. Yeah, it's really interesting, and like the way they mix it is going to be different. So I, mm. I actually, I, I think it could be one of the different things. It could be a different performance. I don't think it is because it lined up pretty nicely when I put it in. the Yeah, in that the, seems more like a the, Williams privilege. I, th- I think, I think it's, um, I think it's actually that. They they're just like it's just so much better mixed as an orchestra that you can really you can hear some of the voices that are starting to sneak in and add tension sooner. I think um, it's just so much better mixed as a, and not as even a and not even better, but like they're mixed yeah, for better. different mediums. Like so, the CD like better you know, meaning like it's a more like uh, specific fuller for music. The sake. Full of, that's what I mean by better. Not for better sure, for sure. Better. Like for our purposes, it's better for listening to the, actually the clarity in the like in the composition. Yeah. And it, this does bring up like such an interesting point about like Star Wars fans often being having these competing um, desires for like Star Wars fans a lot will think that they want a soundtrack that is just the audio from the movie or right. or with but without the dialogue like just you know just give me the mix that is exactly in the movie but without the dialogue because you know people. It might it bothers some people or people don't understand, I should say, is really where it comes from is like why some tracks will be out of order or will have se- sections cut out or they'll be longer than what they hear. Like it just doesn't flow in the exact same way that it does in the film. And a lot of that is just because they're I mean, they're once like all the stuff is recorded, it kind of it gets optimized for, for, for all these different purposes. So like the soundtrack will be mixed to have a good listening to an album experience. And then that actually gets pressed, that gets finished before the um, final press, you know, the final sound for the film, which is the very last thing that gets done before the film like comes out is like the final sound mix for the film. Like it's hard to believe, but like John Powell has said in interviews that like the last minute swap of chicken in the pot, like the soundtracks had already gone, the soundtrack had already gone to pressed pressing, which is why chicken in the pot is the, other version on the original yeah. version of the soundtrack. But hmm. the very last thing that was changed was like changing some of that source music, you know, the chicken in the pot stuff and whatever. And then like pretty much as soon as you turned it in, it was like the movie came out. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. Um, it's cool. 
Um, Did you hear the Imperials? D. <laughs> I wasn't really listening. Okay. Mm. But yeah, yeah, I heard it. <laughs> sure. <laughs> so I, 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 I think I'm splitting the difference between like, I agree that the effect is better that it gets cut off prematurely in the film. Yeah. Though I st- still wish that the music were higher in the mix because I, yeah. I think it would have been even more effective if the crescendo had begun and it weren't so like squashed yeah. down. Yeah, maybe because uh, I think the point I think what it's trying to tell you is like there is a duel about to happen, and the surprise is how soon it happens, right? Yeah, because yeah. you're basically you see him touch you like go and, and grab his his holster. So you're like, oh, they're about to kill each other, but the fact that it hits you even sooner than you probably even expected to it is the effect it has. And if the and if the music was higher in the mix, you could maybe hear that a little bit. You could get because it really starts to build. And I don't know what the voicings are, what the chords are, harmony, whatever. But there's like yeah. there's dissonance happening sooner than you actually detect it in the final product. You know, that's a good point. I think the way that the chords progress are very like I, I like how they bit like they add tension without being like over the top. Yeah. 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 It's nice. Think of, yeah, it's nice it stuff. is nice. I think this is some nice yeah. underscore here. Yeah. And um, um, I'm pretty. I I'm pretty jealous of of. By the way, you know, th- this section. I'm pretty jealous of your next, um, show uh, guests because they get to talk next week. Maybe they already talked about it, but the only instrument ever named by name in Star Wars history is in this movie, to my knowledge. What the Valacord? There's no, what other instrument on screen has ever, has anyone ever said the name of a Star Wars instrument on screen in a movie other than that, that instrument? Well, in, in this in movie, they movie? talk about Valacord a few times. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. That's the one. Right. Like, this, in this movie, they talk about that instrument. In any other movie, have they ever mentioned an instrument name ever? I don't know. We've, we've seen instruments, but no, James, I think yeah. you're right. I, they've no never one's ever named an instrument. Said, do, may they, said, do they say drums for anything? For anything, do they ever say like play the no. drum? No, no, I don't think so. Oh, that's a valid chord. Well, that's see, here's wild. the thing. It's There's like, a, okay, it's like a listeners. Quorum. If you want, it's if cool. you want to go back to the speculation about valacord, I think episode six of this season is called Valacord Envy, and we talk all about yeah. spe- like we do a lot of speculating yeah. on what the valacord sounds like because it's referenced a lot. It's also in the book Aftermath, but cool. there uh-huh. is no official like we never see it on screen. And the way that different people have described it in different media, it's like how is this all one instrument? It's like you yeah. can pluck it, but then it's like so big, but it looks like you can also blow into it. And so, um, yeah, I have I have That's all cool. these theories about what the Valacord is. It, it, yeah. At this point, it's an undesigned thing. So like people are just describing it. Basically, it's like a it's a percussion instrument. It's a wind instrument. It's a it's yeah. a plucky. You know, I, I always thought of it as like kind of like an omnichord kind of a thing. Where right. It's like it's it's like the electronic version of an auto harp kind of a thing where I hold a button Mm. down and then strum across the touch plate and it just plays this chord for me kind of a thing. Um, My idea is that it's like, I think it's sort of like how one man band people will be, will have like all those instruments on them and it'll be like kind of like uh, an all in one. And even if you just think of like a a drum kit, like kind of an all in one sort of kit setup, like I think the Valachord is probably like an instrument used to entertain and it is very versatile and can do a lot of self accompaniment. Like it can, you can do a lot of things with it. Um, and I also think it's like, we're, anyway, this is a little too in the weeds. I think, it, well, I right. think that it's not manufactured. Well, I'm not jealous anymore since we're sucking content from your next week's podcast. I, love it. <laughs> I think um. it, it is. I think it's like probably only rich people have them because they're so yeah. like, it's like harps or like harps and grand pianos and stuff like that. And they're probably like commissioned, like, artisanal designed i think there's probably no standard manufacturing there's all valacords are different sort of like harpsichords i think you know it's yeah, i think yeah. it's more mm-hmm. like, I like it. yeah anyway like so Kamalan instruments um i uh yeah it's interesting yeah i like somebody do research i think that's the first one in star wars film history i'm sure it's obviously there's been instruments in the books and maybe in clone wars or cartoons i don't think so though i think that i think in in visual video medium, film and video, I think it's the first one that's ever been named in Star Wars, ever. The funny thing about cool. this is I know what's going to happen is after this episode is posted, like in a couple of weeks, James will come back and he's going to comment. He's going to be like, actually, I found... So, I don't think so, though. I think <laughs> I'm right. 
think I'm right on this You say one. this every episode. You, you like okay, to make maybe. a bold claim, <laughs> just in case. <laughs> okay, so we're nearing the... It creates interaction, you know? You want people... Oh, I don't say, mind it. I just think yeah, it's yeah. a very James thing to do. And, um, sure. you know, it makes me think. Um, so <laughs> the very, very last few seconds of the minutes mm-hmm. are just some... That's the gang motif. I have a smart move, kid. For once. And that's where it cuts off. It's the gang motif with violin, artificial harmonics. Mm. And, um, you know, it it does sound pretty like Dies Irae adjacent there without being directly referenced. But that's it. Those are the minutes. Solid, solid five. It's very nicely contained five too, might I add. I'm surprised that this is yeah. like you haven't fudged the fudged the margins a little bit here. Hmm. On the, yeah. This is like, there's like very clearly like, it's all contained there. We, like we didn't really run it. We kind of ran into the middle of the fight, but it's really, not really. It's like the moment Kira, yeah. Kira, what do you kills. call it? Uh, uh, switches and yeah. kills, kills start, decides to kill Dryden. And then it ends right when... Um, Woody Harrison's character is shot. It's really nicely contained five. It, nice. Every all the last sets of five have been like that, and it's been like very. It's almost been strange, like strangely perfect. Yeah. So it's like the five before this ended right when like dried or right when Beckett was making the switch. So it was like mm. it ends like right at the right point for the next one to take off. It's yeah. It very yeah. The way that this and all th- come happens at the end. Z- and Xanthi, I think you mentioned this when we first did this recording. Uh, the last time James and I were on the main show, I think we also did minutes one sixteen through yeah. twenty. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> You're so now I got to look at what's what's next season. I got to go look up those minutes. Empire so we'll, Strikes we'll Back. Well, right. Well, this is a very <laughs> different. Oh, <laughs> Empire next. Yeah, Ooh, empires. Ooh, I know. Good stuff. Well, this is a very different like um, ending action to this film than what we had, with, which was the Battle of Yavin. Like how different of an ending of a film? Quite different. Quite different. Well, it just yeah. shows what the stakes are in this type of film, are, right? Mm-hmm. It's like it's like the stakes in A New Hope are like the whole galaxy depends on it, and this is like a Star Wars story. It's really a, a, a character study between characters, you know. Yeah. Um, so I guess that makes sense, Very as true. opposed to like, you know, you know, the giant lightsaber fights between major players and stuff like that. True. Um, Okay, so before we wrap up, um, I'll do the Twitter theme questions. run. I'll do the, the I'll do the theme rundown first, and then uh, mm-hmm. just so I don't forget. So the themes in these minutes are young Han Solo, the heroic version, mm-hmm. Rebel fanfare. Where Han- does the Rebel fanfare happen? It was briefly when, um, when after post Dryden being killed, and kind of pre piano romantic theme. So it's mm-hmm. like after. When Kira she sees kills, the jewels, right? Yeah, when she, yeah, she's like, "We're gonna need them." I have to say that I, I went and listened to that moment, mm-hmm. and these are like, these are. Like, is it confirmed that, that was what? Because it's really no, just this like, is just what really I think. Just like a, no, oh, this is you thinking this. Yeah, this is just me oh, thinking thought, this. Oh. So you're welcome to say like, I don't think that one counted. It was too ah, scant. I think there's some similarities. I can hear it, but I, I don't think it's like the. Bam, 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 bam. It's for sure. Just like bam. Yeah. No, I mean, I think the only, <laughs> yeah, like my list sometimes will have a couple themes on it that I, like sometimes when I'm recording at the last minute, I'm like, I'm not going to say that one. I, I actually don't, but I don't think I, that one. The uh, if the rep, I'll, I'll give you this. If the rebel fanfare never existed within the Star Wars musical repertoire, I don't think that moment would have happened like that. What? That's my <laughs> hypothesis. Like, it you don't think like, they would have shown a shot like that? No, I don't I, think I, that I get, they would have scored it with saying. that. I think, oh, I see I what you're saying. The, I think the harmonic, the little, the musical aesthetic ugh, it's a, of that moment. It's an aesthetic reference. It's like, it's like almost subconscious. It's like, it just sounds like Star Wars because we've heard it like that. And it's because it's probably whatever chord it is. I, what is it? The flat, flat six chord or something? I don't know. Uh, uh, it's whatever is going on there, like voicing wise, et cetera. I think would only exist because of the rebel fanfare, though I don't know if it's actually that theme. So I mean, yeah, I mean, I only think that, like, I'm only naming it as the rebel fanfare because of 
going through the rest of the movie and seeing other contexts in which it does pop up. Uh, so it makes me feel more okay. confident in being like, oh, okay, mm. it's probably another one of those. Cause okay. they I take are pretty... back everything I just said. <laughs> okay, <laughs> good. I'm right. Um, <laughs> okay. But also what you said is also true where sometimes it's not yeah. the direct theme, but because another sort of connecting another thread that goes throughout Star Wars is not just the themes themselves, but also these, what Frank Lehman calls associative progressions. So whether it's the rebel fanfare or whether it's just another instance of like this same kind of pro progression, you know, it, you know, like this one is what he calls um, the G major to E major. Um, he calls this progression um, heroism. And so, um, which is, the Rebel Fanfare, and yeah. other themes that actually have the same progression. It's also in the main theme. It's also in the TIE Fighter Attack. It's also in Yoda. So, you know, it's it's in a few different, it's in a few different places. So, yeah. Um, okay, so the themes also, are... It's Clearwater song. Oh, wait, it's, it's, it's rolling on the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think. Okay. <laughs> okay, so the themes from these minutes okay. are Young Han Solo, Heroic, Rebel Fanfare, Han and Kira, Secrets, Duel of the Fates, Chant, Duel of the Fates, Theme, and The Gang. And in the soundtrack, we are on Dryden's Long Long Fight, 6M41-42. Also, on the regular version of the soundtrack, Testing Allegiance. And then back to the deluxe version, it's Maul's Call slash Parting Ways, 7M43-44-45. Um, fun times. Okay, so the very last few questions are, we're going we're gonna to lightning this as much as possible. Um, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which, is what, which is what we said a few days ago, too. Um, we didn't do. And these are questions. <laughs> James is on. Um, oh, no. We'll explain after. Uh, <laughs> these questions are from Alex Cunningham, um, aka Brick Steelhead on Discord. Um, and so the questions are I'm going to let's do one and two at the same time. So, um, what is the closest you personally ever got to scoring a film yourself? And okay. what about composing or performing for film do you find most doable? And what do you find most daunting? So, let's go. James first. Okay. So yeah, I've I've scored um, some uh, sh short films and uh, and other video content before, and uh, one of the, my one of the ones that I had the most fun on and um, and would love for people to check out eventually when you check out. I think the trailer's out there. I think she still is touring it for the last couple of years at festivals, which is really interesting. Is uh, I worked with a, a director, um, uh, Egyptian. A uh, director named uh, Shireen Atif, and she made a film uh, set in uh, uh, about the Bedouins in uh, in in the Middle East, and uh, it's called uh, Jebel Banat, and uh, and she uh, submitted it uh, for um, uh, for a number of festivals, and they got into Cannes and Tribeca, which was was which was a blast, uh, and I got to use all these uh, different textures and sparse percussion sounds and Arabic percussion and traditional. Um, uh, you know, um, different, different ideas. It was really a lot of fun. Um, and then, uh, what the second question was like, what do we find fun or easy and daunting? Yeah. Like approachable and daunting. I, uh, I think for me, the easiest part is just like the recording of stuff, like uh, the physical, just tracking it and playing. Like I have a blast with that. Just like let me just play something. I've I've been in sessions where I'm like just the percussionist. There's like an engineer present, and that stuff is great. I could just play all day. What I don't like is have it is the not that it's not that I don't like it. It's just daunting and can be overwhelming sometimes. Is having to be the producer, the engineer, the mixer, running the boards, all of those things that often come with being an independent composer, right? Where you're asked to score for something and it's not like you can be like, okay, great, where's my studio? Do you have an engineer for me? Mm -hmm. right? And also no, you're talking like, about, at least in terms of this one, you're talking about you're composing and you're performing. You're doing both. 
Yeah, like like yeah, usually, right? These days. Yeah, um, yeah. It's very it's very it's rare that you'd be that you have a budget to bring on a whole bunch of friends to perform stuff for you. I mean, sometimes it happens, but usually it's like here's the money and you, you're just taking it out of your own pocket at that mm-hmm. point because it's like you either keep all the the whole budget for yourself or you use some of it to hire some of your friends. Yeah, you know, to to do it, which I've done before. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, anyway, just the just the whole like DIY element of it can be daunting as somebody that like. Is I, I started out as a player and a writer first, and then had to become an engineer just by sheer necessity. So yeah. So yeah. yeah. Justin, um, I haven't had a whole lot of opportunity to work on specifically for uh, like films with like speaking and dialogue and that kind of a thing. I, I had one experience a long time ago with the during my student years, which uh, I've blocked from my memory because it was such a horrific experience, <laughs> horrific experience with a lot of uh, 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 expect- surprised expectations to kind of appear without discussion and things like that. Um, but I, I have had the opportunity to uh, uh, do Foley for a number of dance films. Mm. Um, and I did write music for, uh, write music for a dance film, but it was more along the lines of I wrote the music first and a film was kind of mm-hmm. made around it versus mm-hmm. here's the thing, you know, um, working with dance, uh, uh, working with dance films is a little bit different than working with a, a more cinematic film. I, I'm just going to say that word, like a more uh, uh, acting <laughs> film kind of a thing. It's just a different process, which is uh, both interesting and frustrating at the same time kind of a thing. Um to go with the second question, I think the easiest thing for me, uh, uh, at least the more exciting thing for me, is the fact that I can do everything myself. Um, I've got all these things around me. I can be in control. I can uh, uh, produce and mix and and record everything from my apartment if I really, really wanted to. If I had the opportunity to work in the budget with other players and all these things like that, oh, absolutely, I'd take that. That'd yeah. be <laughs> that's the dream. But the fact that I can, can kind of come across a, a project and do it on my own is what's exciting. What's daunting and not exciting for me, which we all have to deal with no matter what. It's just part of the game is changes, yeah. um, uh, especially. And the two versions I've experienced is one is the yeah we like the music that you wrote, but minute. In your six minutes, minutes three and a half to four and a half just doesn't work. Can you do something else? That's kind of a creative struggle where you're like, uh, you know, let me just, yeah, sure, chop off this one minute of connecting material and try and reconnect these ideas in a completely different way, but still works, but still pleases you mm-hmm. and things like that. Um, or the other frustrating version is in the folly that I've done where they'll give me a new edit of the film. And then all of a sudden, all the sound design and the foley that you've meticulously placed every footstep no longer oh, lines yeah. up. <laughs> yeah. So oh. you either have to re-edit what you've already done or just completely re-record everything. That's so oh, that weird. sounds really tough. <laughs> and and that, that can get a little uh, obnoxious. Yeah. So it's very cool but, that you've you know, done foley, though. Like, that's it, super, super cool. It is it's really fun. Cool. I love working with people like Justin. Because yeah. Because... Because your le- like it's he- your love language being all that intricate production crap, like that is not my love language. That is like I love when I can just like it's so nice when you work with people that like are in- are like into, into parts slightly of the different that, things that mm-hmm. you aren't into and yeah. you're into things that they're not into because then you can sh- really feel like you're sharing the load and not feel like you're like carrying too much of the weight on the project. Mm-hmm. You know, and That's and Justin really and I good. have collaborated before many mm-hmm. times. Mm -hmm. Um, Justin actually did the live, the house mixing. He was the front of house sound engineer for a couple of my concerts. Yeah. 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 Like for when I, when when we performed my, like the full length album, um, as a live concert, Justin like ran, ran sound for that. And that's like kind of the first time Justin and I met and started, yeah, doing stuff. Um, later on we, I mixed one of your, uh, yep. He mixed my track. Oh yeah, was I think you mixed between stations, probably. Mm-hmm. Yep, yep. Between so stations. you can you can find that on Spotify and everywhere. Um, but yeah, Justin has has worked on a lot of stuff with me, and we've also performed together too. So, but anyway, the 
yeah, I've scored a couple. I've scored some indie projects myself as well. Um, one of them, I'll put a link in the show notes. You can watch on PBS Indies. Um, it's Ooh. called Vominos. And um, uh, the other ones, you know, like many indie project projects, are hard to f- really get a hold of to be able to see online. You know, you have to mm-hmm. really have seen it at a festival or, right. I don't know, it's kind of, I can't, I don't even, I should probably get copies of them for myself. But um, okay. yeah, the most daunting part or the fun part for me is like any, the aspects of doing the work, like creating, coming up with the stuff, like I, that I feel very, um, I, I'm inspired and I don't really have that much writer's block ever. Um, I get really stumbled up when I have like a tech problem in the middle of a creative flow. So like, kind of like what James said, when, when I'm doing like everything myself is when it gets really, um, it can get really awful, but like, it could be really smooth sailing if it's just a really, really good tech day though. Like it, it really just depends. And then also just like the emails and stuff. Like it's often so much so much extraneous, it's often so much drama (laughs) and so Mm. much, um, organizing that I don't really have, I feel like I don't have the bandwidth to like be my own organizer of everything and the contracts and like delivering the stuff in the proper formats and just doing the meticulous, like non-musical stuff is very daunting for me. It's so daunting that it's enough to make me not really seek out that work very much, which kind of sucks, but yeah, it, It is very, it's pretty much insurmountable for me sometimes. Hmm. Um, and then the you final actually, question. Yeah. Yeah. Just let me throw one more thing in there for the daunting part. You know what else is daunting is like the fact that the expectation mm. that your stuff sound like, like just perfect. I mean, yeah. like, 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 like that's the expectation industry strand, industry standard. And you really have to keep, like, in my experience, I feel like I really have to keep up with, like, what software I have, oh what, my God, you know, yeah. what yes. what sample libraries I have. And if they if the samples don't sound, like, perfect, it's like, it's, you know, and then also just the tweaking of all, because you're basically like, how do, if I, especially if we're writing something that's, like, wants to sound orchestral, right? You really got to make that thing sound like, a, like you have a real orchestra. And I... That's like just insane ask of somebody like, hey, can you write something that sounds like John Williams? Oh, but by the way, like you don't have any budget to hire any real musicians for yourself. Yeah. And I, I envy people like Xanthi because they can like play the violin. <laughs> and, that makes I things can. a lot easier. Yeah. You know, it is nice and, to be able to uh, track my own string orchestra. But right, I, I, and, I envy people like you because then you can track your own drums. So, so. Yeah, but mm-hmm. if there's one thing that sounds really, really close to the real thing, it's a single <laughs> attack of a sample of a symbol or triangle or like, I'm sorry. True. But like, you're, you're also not- speaking from the perspective of that's something that you're very good at. And, and so like, it's easy for you to sort of dismiss what, cause I like, I truly am like, I see Dude, the skills gotta, that both of you, you need, have. And I'm like, yeah. wow. You don't need to do anything that involve for industry standard percussion parts. Just get the, the, the standard. <laughs> 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 oh my God. Crash. Yeah. Right, it's all right. good. It's all fine. You'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> me, me trying to create like like you know uh, uh, convincing violin parts is a little. Sorry, let's not have a battle of who has it worse here. Okay. Um, let's no, continue. but I see what you're saying, James. Like, <laughs> if I wanted to write a violin solo yet couldn't, yes. or the director said, I really need that violin solo, mournful yes. and things right here, and oh, I yeah. did not That's have my bread the money. And butter. No, but and I didn't have so, the money to go to Chris Anthe and say, hey, I've got, here's my budget. Can you write this? Can you not write, but can you record this 30 second thing for me? Instead yes. of having that immediate, like, oh yeah, here it is in two takes. Oh, that's perfect. I have to sit there with a not up to par a violin sample and sit there and automate and program Every li- hours of programming just yeah. to get this thirty seconds to sound like what you like just did yeah. in thirty seconds. <laughs> no, that's <laughs> you know? that's 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 very true. Like the the that's gap done. between the the gap between like what is expected and what is possible, and like di- what your starting cards are, can make a hu- can make such a difference. Mm-hmm. It's like not even funny. Like the people who yeah. often get their start and really get into the industry, like have a lot of help getting set up with like all of this stuff, or like yes. have a very close network either like roommates or friends, like, you know, or people who are, play all the right things. It's very hard, Mm -hmm. like, 
to just build up all this stuff by yourself. And it's a huge barrier to entry. And so I think, yep. yeah, it is. I would say there's yeah. two things. If you, uh, if you're a composer out there, someone listening to this and you want to write like film music, and this is actually, it's kind of interesting that we're kind of talking about this because I know what the next question is. And I think this is kind of an interesting counterpoint to that. But, uh, and if you want to write film music and you already know how to play violin or viola or even cello, actually cello would be a, per, a really nice one to be able to play. You already have a leg up. Like all you have to do at this point is spend countless hours learning about software, but like that's a lot easier to do than go <laughs> yeah, back in yeah, time yeah. and learn and how to play the violin. That's okay? true. Like, that's true. Okay. Yeah. So I can't do that. Like, there's no amount of time I'm going to be able to spend over the next, eh, I could probably get pretty good violin. I, got, I, I should have better faith in myself. I could probably get pretty convincingly good at violin over the next six years if I practiced every day to the point where I could edit <laughs> myself to sound like I know what I'm doing. I, I bet. I bet I could do that. I bet I can believe myself in that that point. Uh, is, I, I'll say that. In fact, I'm going to do that, and I'll talk to all of you okay. in six years. Okay. Six okay. years from now. Check back in. Okay. See, the thing is, I'm like, I could this. say that too, but like, and then also, I'll bring us all to Disneyland. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but also, I know that, like, even, even, like, oftentimes the best, the thing that makes um, post production, mixing, editing easier. Sometimes the things that make it easier are honestly practicing and being better at your instrument, so that you because yep. always like the most annoying thing of all on top of all of this is like the better input, the better output. Like you can't really, mm -hmm. like if you yeah. have something that's not like really, really amazing going in, then it's like exponentially increases the amount of editing afterward. It's like not linear at all. It's like, yep. it's, it's so much easier if I can just, if I just will take a day off and just like practice for like six hours and get yes. really, really know what I'm doing than it is to be like, okay, it's fine. I'm just going to kind of hack this and then splice, like edit it all together. Yes. Like mm -hmm. that's okay, harder. Yeah. That takes more time on the back end, way more time. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh my gosh. It's a whole thing. Yeah. But yeah, we have to be software engineers too nowadays. So, um, okay. So the final question and, um, this is really funny if you had heard our conversation last night. Um, or three, day, three days ago, because uh -huh. this question got a little bit heated. Um, also, I'll also take this opportunity to say that we, um, that episode with the alternate ending, the one that has the bad audio in the last <laughs> half, in the last 90 minutes, it's like, yes. um, I think maybe I'll put that out as like a, uh, unlisted or maybe just patron only or just like a maybe maybe just maybe. like a we're gonna put an asterisk not on publicly that and you and you and i will go discuss that uh, offline i think yes we will uh, <laughs> um but yeah that you won't hear us i don't think you'll hear us going into that argument today so no. um yeah okay so the question from alex was do you think there will always be a place for conventional slash he wrote he writes conventional in air quotes do you think there will always be a place for conventional slash orchestral film scores or are we moving away from them more as composers and artists blend genres experiment and innovate all right sh sh should Let's... i go first <laughs> yes okay all right so i think i think the answer to this question quite simply is yes okay because the question is, will there always be a place for conventional orchestral films? Yeah, of course. I think that if comp composers will continually want to use the, the standard Western orchestra, um, they'll continue to want to use it. I think. I think it might. I think it will definitely become less common in the future. Uh, and I, I actually think that's. And I, to summarize my 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 feelings and opinions on that, is I feel positively that it will become less common in the future. I personally feel that way uh, because I uh, am always eager to hear things. I feel like the in film history, the Western Standard Orchestra has taken up a lot of space in, in Hollywood, specifically Hollywood, American films. Um, and so I'm always eager to hear, you know, uh, departures uh, from that. And I also think, you know, just culturally, I think the Western Classical Orchestra has a lot of um, uh, has has done is it, it represents a very specific and limited cultural um, uh, scope, and, and I think um, more uh, more sounds could uh, from elsewhere could be properly represented. Okay, and I should say make sure I say properly represented. Okay, um, um, and I think that 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 will be refreshing, and that will be also fantastic to, to hear. 
um, for more main. I mean, we can't deny the the um, the 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 monetary leg up that movies from Hollywood have over cinema um, from elsewhere, right? I mean, it's Hollywood has more money, it's got a better d- distribution ability, and it's mo- it's more commonly seen as, uh, than other industries around the world. So naturally, lots of um, uh, you know Western instrumentation makes its way into a lot more households across the globe than from any other any other area. Um, and what I should say is like getting rid of the orchestra thing or not getting rid of it, but just like moving away from that, I think is ultimately a good thing um, because it be, it gives it gives the opportunity for for more instruments, more sounds and more more things to be heard. And that, I just think that's a good thing going going forward. It's taken up a lot of space and that's and it, and it did it did its 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 job. It will continue to do its job. And I think more and people will continue to want to write for that, that, um, but I just think, you know, or, or could just have a lot of cultural capital in people's minds, I think, you know, um, and I, and I think it would be nice to, to see other, other instruments and other instrumentations and ensembles get that same cultural capital in people's, in people's minds. So. Cool. Justin? Uh, very similarly, the same answer. Uh, yes, absolutely. Yes. There'll always be a place. I think what's cool and exciting about nowadays is that uh, it's more acceptable to not, uh, it's, it's more, it's more commonplace to not use an orchestra, especially now because sure. films are made differently. The timeline is so quick. We don't have well, let me rephrase. We have the budget for an orchestra, but we've reallocated perhaps the budget to something else within the film. So, and the fact that we could put an entire orchestra on our laptops now without ever having stepping in front of a real one has changed how we approach film scores. And so, in, in even in that sense, I go back to not just film scores but TV. Um, I, I mentioned this in the last. Uh, the last recording of this Stranger Things has been one of my favorite things to come out of film music, TV music, media music in a long time. And the fact that there are hints of orchestra, of course, especially in this last season, a lot of that was done with synthesizers, if not 90% of it done with a few synthesizers and two composers um, and to make it so effective um, at the same time um, was really, really cool. So the fact mm. that we have all these other options is really, really excited, exciting. Or even I think it was the, 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 uh, the Birdman soundtrack that uh, Michael Keaton was in, I think was entirely a drum set. Like the entire score was, was yeah, just yeah, a, yeah. a drum set kind of oh. a thing. So there was no... Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, I forget who the player is on. I should, I should know that. I should know the drummer. Right, but it was a, it was but it was incredibly cool and effective. It's a serious you know? huh. drummer. You know? That's cool. Um, yeah, there, yeah, and even a really some of the great s- sequence. Yeah, Antonio um Sanchez, right? Um yeah. yeah, did the did that whole did that whole solo drum score for that. For and that even movie. some of the wow. episodes from Visions that this group like uh, talked about. Oof. Like Akakiri, which was yeah. entirely done that. by a you know, great tabla player. Great mm-hmm. It was um, a- uh, was yeah, that's you know, a great. Us, uh, that's a great. Yeah, that was thing like of one what of I'm kind of talking about here. Let's mm-hmm. use non-Western instruments for once on on the and it, with the with with to American audiences. But let's use it. Pro- let's take people that know what they're doing and put it in front and use it so people can be like, oh, I've heard this wonderful, beautiful instrument that I maybe have never heard before in this high profile piece of American uh, uh, media and exactly. hearing it being used. With all the care and intricacy, and and uh, bringing out its unique qualities, the same way that I've been listening to people do for Western instruments my entire life, you know. Exactly. So it's so I think just with the the idea of conventional and whether orchestras, I think it'll definitely become more of a directorial aesthetic. Do we want to throw back to the John Williams golden age of the orchestra, film orchestra kind of sound, or do we want to do yeah. something like? the Dark Knight trilogy where it was James Newton Howard and Hans Zimmer using an orchestra along with All closely mic solo instruments and electronics, but using it in mm-hmm. such a way that wasn't the grand sweeping neo-romantic right. uh, kind of style. Um, 
I, I, yeah, I, think, I think that'll yeah. that's gonna go forward in a really. I think we'll probably time. see movies that are kind of like throwback movies, right? We're gonna see mm-hmm. like I think the time that we're really gonna hear those types of scores are when it's being specifically used for the for nostalgia, almost nostalgia's sake, or not maybe not nostalgia's the right word for it, but like you know if we have a period piece, right? Or if we have a. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, or a movie that's kind of like what was that movie that um that came out a a, while, a second ago that was like kind of like oh man what was it um oh man I can't think of it it was a movie that was kind of like oh, I can't I can't remember it there was a, a movie <laughs> that I'm trying to remember what it was. oh it was like Super Eight okay Super Eight um, yeah 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 was like J J Abrams like specifically went. Fe- set out to make like a movie that was like something you would see in the 80s right like mm-hmm, a movie mm-hmm, mm-hmm. it wasn't like set i think it might have been set in the 80s i don't remember uh, but it was like let's make a movie that feels like one of those classic spielberg movies right and i don't remember honestly i don't remember what the music was like but i feel like i feel like if they make a movie like that in the future like let's make a movie that feels like indiana jones even if it's not an indiana jones movie and then, therefore, the score might be like kind of reference that type of movie, mm-hmm. you know, because mm-hmm. it because it kind of larks back. Or it kind of wasn't the artist that silent film kind of the score to that movie was very similar to, to uh, to old 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 uh, Charlie Chaplin movies and stuff like that. Yeah, I believe so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I feel like the answer to this is kind of interesting. The way this is worded, this question, which is like, do you think there will always be a place, always be a place for conventional uh, film scores, or? Are we moving away? Kind of the answer to this question is, yes, we are moving away from them as more composers, but there will always be a place mm-hmm. for conventional mm-hmm. orchestral mm-hmm. film scores. Like, you kind of the answer is in the question, you know? Um, right. Um, I think, at least yeah. to my opinion of the answer to that question. Right. I mean, uh, Star Wars itself is a throwback to, is a throwback yeah. to the certain type of, you know, Errol Flynn movie. Um, yep. And so... It, yeah, obviously, like, I, not to like nitpick the question because I don't. I think I think the question reveals um, probably a, a lot of how a lot of people f- conceive of this. And so my answer to this would be like, I would agree that yes, there will always be a place if that's what people want to write and if that's what the film wants to have. Um, but also, I think, and this is the exact reason. This is why I ask in the Star Wars Music Minute questionnaire, what does Star Wars sound like? Because yeah. the reason is because when we throw out terms like these, everyone has different like pockets of it that they that are salient to them. And so mm-hmm. like hearing like, oh, this sounds like a classic Star Wars score. To some people, it's yeah. like just the mere fact that it's orchestral. To some people, it's mm-hmm. the fact that there are themes that they recognize. To some people, it's the fact that there's, you know, it, like there's different things, like it's so different for everyone. It's, um, and so there is no like orchestral film scores. I don't even, I don't even know what that, necessarily implies because I think there's the style I think is one thing like this the writing style is one thing and I think the instruments are uh, another thing and I think the process is another thing so I don't and I actually don't think um like are we moving away from them as more composers and artists blend genres um I wouldn't actually give as much agency to the composers and artists in leading the way on this I mean I think no I think they will I think they will you know, we'll lead the way on this, yeah. but I think it really matters what the what the film as a whole, like what the whole production is willing to afford, what it is willing to allow. Like yeah. I think that we are definitely innovation is definitely a thing, but like I don't, I'm, I don't care one way or another whether we like I am not invested in the idea of of seeking non Western instruments and putting them propping them up in American films because I've also seen how doing that has really negatively ha- had negative repercussions on certain cultures where those instruments came in because uh, and so I don't I, but I'm not against that either I think it's just so context dependent what I w- would like is for the, the creators of films uh, you know the directors and the composers to just have the creative freedom to do to do whatever um, mm-hmm. and that's where I think there's going, there's a lot of stumbling blocks in terms of, well, you know, to, to, we have to cater to this audience. This is the only budget we have. You have to do a mock-up. Like you, ha- there's all these, all these sort of stipulations. Um, and also I will say that like, just speaking from the, you know, American Federation of Musicians side of things, like 
orchestras, I think orchestras are mm, fewer and fewer people are, it's no longer, um, prof, it's no longer really a good living to be making, to be, rec be in a recording orchestra, like to be recording for films or even to really score a lot of films because of the way that laws are structured. So like, I think, I mean, this is kind of a boring answer, but like, I think these creative decisions are also just very driven by economics, by what protections we're giving our citizens, our, our artists to mm -hmm. actually give them the freedom. So like, if you're not even gonna make royalties or if you're, God forbid, they're not gonna put actually put out your film. So you're not actually gonna get a release and you're not gonna get royalty. Like then yeah. it's, I don't see like much economic incentive for people to even try to do that. And yeah. I'm I, like, this is, I don't wanna get into economics at all, but like, I just think uh, artists of all walks kind of struggle sometimes, you know, to, just have a comfortable baseline of like living. And so that makes it kind of, when you're, when, it, when you're in that state, it's kind of hard to, um, I don't know, it's kind of hard, to, it's kind of hard to innovate and it's hard for like you, a, a, a studio to take a chance on something like that. And to pay you, give you a bit big enough budget to like work with whoever you want or to hire the orchestra if you want to work with an orchestra um, and give, you know, people work, give people work and not outsource your orchestra to other countries like Prague where you don't, where you only do that because your film didn't give you the budget to go with American players because you don't want to pay, you don't want to go with the union mm -hmm. rules. You just want to do a buyout for cheap. So you go, anyway. Anyways. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. There's totally. just, it's, it, there, it's a, there's a, it's a complicated question and landscape with no simple answers and there's no answer that is just purely based on aesthetics and how creative development is like how people's preferences are moving forward like yeah. this is yeah. the laws the studios it's all think, wrapped up i think that it's fair to say though that like in the future you will have significantly less movie scores that sound anything like john williams absolutely like for sure like that's it's I already that's like it's already true it's already there but like you're not even going to get like yeah, people that yeah. are trying to sound like John Williams anymore, you know? Yeah, um, I think we're just going to get all... Well, I don't want to get... Well, I, I hope... Actually, I don't want to put them into the universe. Maybe things can turn around. Yeah. Um, so, um, great. So, thank you for the questions. And finally, the last thing we're going to do is review the Star Wars Music Minute questionnaire. Um, you've already both taken it, but um, if you want to give a new answer, uh, you can do that. Or if you want me to just read what you already said three days ago, I can do that, too. Um so question number one is, in exactly three words, what does Star Wars sound like? Justin. Um, I still can't think of a better way than I put it three days ago kind of thing. I think I was, I think I said it's, uh, what's the Star Wars sounds like to me is grandiose, sweeping, and um, futuristic. From I think that's what very, you said. I actually can't even dated, remember now. Yeah, from a very dated, futuristic from a very dated point of view. As in the seventies, yeah. Um, but uh, still, still very futuristic sounding to me. And last time you said pew pew pew, pew pew pew. James. <laughs> All right. So in uh, in the other Doctor Strange universe of this part of the podcast that exists in the in the in the ether, um, in the world between people, worlds, in the world between worlds, I said classic but fresh, which I th still think is a fantastic answer. Um, but I. Uh, I'm going to go with a new answer, which is mm, bum, bum, bum. Yeah, <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> bum, 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 bum. Oh. Bum. Okay. 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 How there's, do I spell that? B-U-M. B-U-M uh, three times. And I just bum, think bum. that, um, I just think there's also like a lot of triplet pickups throughout. For sure. Throughout, throughout Star Wars in general. Like, yeah. Yeah. You know, all kinds of crap with triplets going on in here. Like, what does the the song Han Solo theme go? How's it go? Like, like, let me just um, quick listen. Bum 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 bum. Bum da 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 da. Or bum 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 bum. Okay, I see it. Bum bum bum. I see your bum 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 is. Bum 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 bum. I mean, I can't argue with that. Can't argue. Can't argue. Um... Question number two, what is something related to Star Wars music or sound that you want to learn more about? Justin. My answer, my answer remains the same 
last time and the time before that, which is I would love to learn more about not just the sound design, but the foley behind all of the classic Star Wars sounds, whether or not there's a big bank of sound effects that we could just pull from now and just insert here, or if they're recreated as much as, and if uh, there is a opportunity to, to create something new, how is that done? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what you said last time. Um, and James? <laughs> Um, I think my answer was I'm very curious what the sets themselves sound like on set. Like what, what, you know, I've been on sets where they play a little bit of audio that, you know, um, with, with the actors. So you have something to react to or some music maybe even sometimes. Um, I'm very curious if like the lightsabers themselves are making a humming sound on set. You know, I, some of these questions can be answered by watching some of those, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, gallery like documentary. Shows. Mm -hmm. Um, but I am very curious about that. I'm very curious at, you know, the volume, uh, I mentioned in the other universe version of this podcast, uh, uh, that the volume itself enables the actors to feel more immersed in the scene, right? they're not like, uh, even, uh, you and McGregor was like, Hey, it's so amazing to be on set and I'd be f surrounded by green, uh, you know, green everywhere. All right. Mm -hmm. like, I actually have like an environment I'm in reacting with and the volume has made that happen. Um, so I'm curious if they've, what kind of sound, um, elements are added in those moments or whether you can, cause they're pick, they're actually recording sounds in, um, in some, some ways. So I'm, 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 I'm curious about that. Uh, I'm just, uh, I'm really curious too. somebody, yeah. somebody with like an Ableton launch pad with all the lightsaber sounds just like live right. <laughs> doing right. that to the fights. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. It would probably have to be the choreographer. Who knows because all the moves? Here's the thing is, <laughs> yeah. Is, here's, here's, here's the thing. Like when you, w we react to sudden sounds, like we can almost not help it, right? And I'm no actor, so I'm out of my depth in even talking about this. But, um, but um, um, having some, like, okay, let's take that, that scene that, we're, that we just discussed with Beckett being shot, right? Like it's one thing to f like to act. I guess it's he's Woody Harrelson. It's literally his job to act like he's surprised that he was just shot. Okay, <laughs> but 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 adding a sound element that's surprising on set is one way to invoke like that type of surprised action. Or like I heard an explosion and I jump away from it. I like there's sound can add elements that that provide things for you to act off of mm -hmm. um, that I imagine would be helpful. Um, so, and especially in Star Wars, where it's like literally things exploding near you, shooting people with blasters, you know, ha feeling the recoil of something, you know, I don't know. I feel like they would be, be useful. If I was setting up a set, I might in include some ways to get the actors to re react to actual real sounds. But, yeah. Um, some more like visceral cues. Like, I agree. Yeah, like, like, okay, we're going to have something explode. We need you to react to it, but we're not going to tell you when the sound effect is right. going to happen. So when it actually happens, you're like, oh, whoa, okay, right? Mm -hmm. um, so. Yeah, I'm, I'm really curious how that works too. Because sometimes they'll just be like, bang, and then you just do it. Yeah, and then you just have to act. Yeah. You know, but... do the thing that they hired you to do. But, uh... <laughs> right. <laughs> well, maybe they do have, maybe they do know what they're doing. Who knows? Who knows? Yeah. Um, okay, the last question is, what is a score or soundtrack that you're fond of besides anything Star Wars? Justin. Oh, um, last time you said The Village, composed by James Newton Howard. Yes, uh, such a great, great score. Um, lately, as I kind of just mentioned, uh, Stranger Things has been on my mind ever since this last season, the music coming back and the changes that they made this season. Um, Big fan, big fan of that entire score and that entire soundtrack. And then a little something more cinematic. I, I mentioned this last Monday and I'm still listening to it, um, is the John Williams War of the Worlds mm -hmm. soundtrack because it's a very interesting departure from his usual cinematic sense, like full of themes or at least recognizable themes and uh, uh, how he builds tension and uh, sound effects that he's using and things like that. Um, really, really great soundtrack. Sweet. James, you said Hereditary and, last time. Uh, yeah, the last, last time. In the other universe, I said Ms. Marvel. Um, mm -hmm. uh, actually, I have a new one, though. Okay. Um, okay, <laughs> so um, everyone, if you're a musician, you should go and watch this movie, uh, or uh, maybe specifically if you're 
a classically and contemporary trained musician, I think you would probably, you're kind of the target audience for this, or if you're in art school. So I'm listening. Unti uh, untitled, okay? And it's a 2009 movie. Um, it's, a, it's a comedy. It's directed by uh, Jonathan Parker, uh, and it stars Adam Goldberg. And um, David Lang did the music. Oh, too, okay? wow. And I love this movie. Set, Sorry, yeah. it's one of the. It's, it's set so good. in like it's downtown. So good. <laughs> it's a parody movie of of downtown art music in New York City, okay, in Manhattan, um, and it's about a an avant garde percussion composer, and he like gets in a relationship with like an avant garde art art uh, gallery owner, and so the whole all, what I love about the score of this well, there's a couple of pieces that are ju actually just David Lang pieces in it. Like there's like press release. And mm -hmm. uh, cheating contemporary wise, composer, like, yeah, for those yeah. listening. And yeah. what I love about the movie is that David Lang was hired to, uh, to 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 write the music, and it's so funny because he like is like a staple of that scene from the early 2000s. Yeah, right? it's really hilarious and, placement. And and he is like writing parody music of his own <sighs> style. Like they you know, like so the soundtrack is kind of there's some moments in it. I mean there's some beautiful moment in it. There's also like so per, there's actually so percussion the uh the percussion ensemble uh East, East Coast percussion ensemble uh from I believe they went to Yale, right? Um and they uh they're actually in the movie performing a percussion piece by uh the so-called Laws of Nature, which is uh by by David Lang. And so there's like real music from that uh, it's very it's very authentic to the scene. And but there's also moments that are just straight up parodies of that scene, which I find so cool that they got somebody, you know, like David Lang to basically parody himself and that scene. Um, uh, and it's a very it's like with love. But here's the thing: it's like if you're, I don't know who that movie is for. If you like, it's kind of like it. It it's a really odd movie because it's like it's so specific to the avant garde art scene that if you're not like in that scene, you would be, you might not enjoy the movie. Like I don't know if it's I don't know if the movie itself is made well enough to be like an actual good enough parody for like anybody else that does. I need to watch this. Like you need. I have to watch this. See, that's funny because I've always said I I love this movie, but I'm so happy that someone else in this world. I didn't even know David Lynch did film scores. He doesn't do film scores normally very very often. I don't know. But I've always felt that 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 movie like it. It does work by itself. If you don't know anything, it's still oh. pretty funny. Wow. But the fact, but if you do know, it's just an extra layer of hilarity and almost scary to the point where like, yeah. oh my goodness, they literally took the New York art scene, put a film to it. And that's, this was the world that we all kind of yeah. somewhat lived in. <laughs> it's really interesting. Wow. By the way, he, I, I just looked up his filmography, actually. He he did, he arranged some things for Requiem for a Dream. Yeah, he arranged the Kronos Quartet, like, mm -hmm. um, you know, parts. Okay. And he scored, um, he scored a number of films, actually. Oh, okay. Uh, He's so most I, known I, for it, founding to Bang on a Can. Of course. Of mm -hmm, course. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, but yeah, there's some movies that I actually haven't seen that he's, I guess he scored. Interesting. Like, they're pretty good. Um, well, thank you for that mo that. I yeah, I definitely want to see that film. Like, well, well here's the here's fun. what I love about it. Okay, uh, the, okay, I, I don't want to give too much away for you, but there's a uh, there's a a piece that I that so many people, at least when I was in college, learn for because uh, um, per, multiple percussion solos are a thing in the percussion world. Essentially, what that is is playing a piece that's written for multiple percussion instruments, um, mm -hmm. and that's, it's called a multiple solo, a multiple multi multi solo right and as opposed to like just playing a marimba or just playing a snare drum or just playing timpani or just playing a single instrument and that's like a whole genre of zanakas wrote a bunch of multi-percussion solos etc um anyway david lang has a, a piece that's played so often and it's called anvil chorus okay mm -hmm. and it's basically made for all these pieces of metal and you hit them with pedals you're hitting them with a hand uh etc <laughs> that piece is used in this movie to score a sex scene <laughs> in this movie which is which is hilarious to me because i i saw so many people just perform this in college like in an academic setting and this movie this is like the score to an intimate uh physical uh scene in this movie which i find and a I very find. funny 
funny, intimate scene. Wow, with yes. okay. So well, I, it's, it's, yeah. It's now you're it's both making fun. me want to watch this ASAP. It's kind of made for us and like right. literally no one else. We should do a movie night. Us. Yes. Which is why no one knows this movie and right. it's really successful. <laughs> And it doesn't and it, even have very good reviews. The fact that it's called Untitled doesn't help, but also it's just it's hilarious parrot. It's in parentheses mm-hmm. and Untitled. Right, which also uh, yeah, works perfectly with, yeah. yeah I feel seen why. in that. I feel in that. I feel a little bit like, damn. Yeah. I don't want to look at how many scores are just called Untitled until they have a title. Um, yeah, so anyway, thank stuff. you for that. Um, where can people find you online? I know you're both uh, on Bandcamp. You, you both have music out. Yeah, if, if you if you search on Bandcamp or SoundCloud for rain goat music, rain like the weather, goat like the animal, music like what we've been talking about, um, uh, you can you can you can find me. <laughs> <laughs> you can you can find me there, or you can also find me on Instagram at J C Shide. Uh, you can find me just about anywhere if you type in the words James Waterman music. So that's like my handle on Instagram. It's my website. Um, probably find my Twitter somewhere. I don't really tweet, as I've mentioned. You only tweets um, to like you can, yeah. respond to something that I've tweeted two months ago and then to be like, what the hell? <laughs> um, yeah, and you can find some of my most recent music uh, under my punk uh, project, which is Jericho Jericho. Just kind of spell out how Chris Jericho's last name is. Um, and yeah, that's me. Cool. And if you want to listen to the three of us talk about Star Wars shows, um, I'll put links in the show notes to the Band Batch um, yeah. talking about the Bad Batch uh, visions and the Book of Boba Fett on YouTube. So We might shows? retroactively do Obi-Wan too. We might. We might. We might Nine. retroactively we'll probably do, do bad bad we'll prob- It's coming out pretty soon, right? Yeah, when we get we'll bad probably bad do Andor too, bad. right? Yeah, I think I think I think we can Let's just do Andor. Can, we can continue doing them from here on out. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So if if you are into this Disney Plus shows, um, you can usually find us on YouTube live streaming. You know, like probably the weekend it comes out, and um, oh yeah, about what our commentary on the music and sound. So yeah, um, yeah, join us there if interested. And mm-hmm. thank you so much for, well, first of all, thank you, James and Justin, for redoing this whole second part. Like, thank you. Also, we were much better in the second part um, <laughs> in, the, in the redo. No, thank you. <laughs> um, and um, thanks, everyone, for listening. May the force be with you. Uh, talk to you next week on Star Wars Music Minute. <laughs> <laughs>